Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. I'm Steve, and today we have um, Tommy and Carl with us today. Um, <clears throat> Carl is um, someone that I had the pleasure of seeing speak uh, back at the uh, Aquaponics Fest, back at the uh, Aquaponics Source, and I think it was 2014, I think it was? I think so. Yeah, um, and he had a, gave a really amazing two-hour-long talk. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, really amazing two-hour-long talk uh, on black soldier flies, and uh, it was really, really cool. So he's with us to talk us, to us about that. Um, so it'll be a really, really cool episode, especially if uh, you know we haven't had an aquaponic uh, guest in a couple episodes. So this will be really neat. Um, so uh, if you guys are also interested, uh, well, shout out to Ouroboros Farms real quick, um, ouroborosfarms.com. Uh, uh, you can check them out. They have a whole wide variety of classes. Uh, I teach a variety of different classes over there with them. Uh, if you're, so check that out. The next aquaponic cannabis class is uh, online and in person on um, September 23rd and 24th. So check it out if uh, you're looking for that. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, well, uh, Carl, uh, why don't you tell us what you what you do and what you've been up to and uh, uh, a little bit about you. Well, since about 2007, I've been working in the bioconversion industry, which uh, specifically pertains to black soldier fly rearing and cultivation. I think the, the latest term they call it is uh, ento technology, ento engineering uh, pertaining to entomology. Uh, it's a fast growing industry now because there are so many beneficial insects uh, as of late that have piqued people's interest in cultivation, everything from crickets to uh, mealworms. And it's an exciting time uh, to be in this industry because of all the momentum. Uh, black soldier fly was one of those early, uh, I guess you call it early adopters when it came to um, bioconversion. Obviously, we've been cultivating insects for decades, you know, the silk moth, uh, the honeybee, and quite a few others. This particular species, which is native of the Southeast, had been kind of rediscovered as a potent force for um, getting rid of uh, waste products, primarily organic waste. And um, it wasn't soon afterwards that people were starting to look at it as a primary source uh, of feed for chickens, fish, reptiles, and other uh, types of uh, animal categories that may uh, have as part of their diet um, live feed. And so uh, it, it originally, when we developed this technology, it was for primarily waste uh, reduction and waste diversion. And it's really gotten, that has taken a back burner to where the end products, the coveted end products, are really what is sought after with the technology. Um, we developed back in 2007 um, some units that are have been updated and improved over the yet over the years, and they still exist today. In fact, it's one of the only products uh, marketable on the planet for easily rearing black soldier flies, and. Um, the reason is we have the special ramp technology, which allows for uh, the auto crawl off, crawl off to be taken advantage of. And that auto separation makes it so much easier to manage the colony without having to manually separate the waste pile and active pile from the finished mature grubs. It's really nice. Uh, if you've ever cultivated earthworms or redworms, you know how much of a challenge it can be separating the waste from uh, the cats, chickens, and worms. Do you want to explain that a little bit more about um, so people that are, haven't maybe kept black soldier flies before about how that works as far as the auto harvesting? Oh, sure. There's an in inherent native, inherent instinctual tendency for the mature grubs of this species once they get to the last instar and become pre-pupa, which is um, uh, notably apparent by the color change from cream to to brown or cream to black. And um, what we did is we took advantage of that instinct and we created some ramps to allow them to evacuate the active waste pile and make it easy for the user to collect them in some type of receptacle. And it is really amazing to see that 
performance occur when you see them marching up the ramps and dropping into your bucket all ready to be carried over to your uh, fish pond or uh, you know poultry uh, pen it's it's really it's really uh, uh, an involved uh, component of the technology the angles are critical the surface um, material is important and uh, they they are limited in how far they will crawl and um, so we, we we looked into it researched it studied it and came up with um, a small unit and a large unit both of which um, have the that component in it a lot of people who make these do it yourself Steve um, they do have a ramp that has a preferred angle and they then fall into the receptacle the problem with the do-it-yourself systems is most of the ones I've seen are made out of wood and that fabricated wood tends to rot very quickly especially with you know the moisture and uh, the acidity of the active pile um, the problem is when you try to um, use pressure treated woods or if you try to seal in um, the wood you can probably you, you run into problems with contaminating the colony and the active pile and so the raw woods are always preferred they just don't last long so we use polyethylene and uh, we've been very pleased with that material awesome so uh, what other um, how, do, how do people so say if someone gets uh, one of your biopods um, what uh, which is the the unit you, you guys have what, how do people go about getting black soldier flies what kind of things can they feed them oh great question um, in regards to attracting black soldier fly for your do-it-yourself pod or um, one of the pods that we manufacture and by the way they're manufactured here in this in this in the US in uh, North Carolina to be specific and that's really nice uh, that they're made here in the States employing people the great thing about this species is that where it, it is located naturally you don't have really a problem attracting them they kind of just show up they can detect even infinitesimal small um, concentrations of odors that come off of any type of putrescent food waste or ripe fruits those odors they detect quickly and they those pregnant females will find food waste so if your zone has them naturally you're going to more than likely unless you're in some microclimate you're going to more than likely attract them um, where they are in the country is zone seven and up is a, usually a sure bet some people tell me in zone six they have sporadically encountered um, black soldier fly i even get people calling me from michigan and northern pennsylvania where i know it's not zone seven uh and telling me that their um their pods are being um, naturally um, seeded with black soldier fly which is great um for those people who live outside the natural zones for um, black soldier fly, like let's say you live in the desert southwest west where there's nothing alive in the insect world, or you live at a high altitude, or you live in the northern tier states, and you're doing it you know, in a climate controlled setting like a greenhouse, you'd have to get um, some grubs online. There is, um, uh, Texas A&M has something called popworms, and popworms is a new, it's a new released uh, method of cultivation. I believe the, the transportation device to get people their babies is called bullets. And they put thousands and thousands of these neonates or cakey or whatever you want to call the babies in these bullets and they ship them to you. And you can get larva growth very quickly from them. But um, Popworms is their name, and I'm trying to think if they have a website. I believe they do, but you could just Google Popworms. Those are just black soldier fly babies. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people who live outside the zones or where they occur naturally can definitely um, uh, order them online. And for, honestly, for people who live in, in the areas where they occur, Steve, you may want to do this in the winter time and obviously there's not a lot of insects around so you can order those online and start your colony indoors you do need 
climate controlled conditions to simulate their native uh, environment. They like it humid, they like it warm. If you have an aquaponic system already that's being conditioned in a space, the black soldier fly will definitely work in, in that capacity. In regards to what to feed them, Steve, um, I've been told that this particular insect larva or maggot or grub or whatever you want to call it, even though it's statistically, st technically a maggot, it has one of the widest digestive enzyme profiles of any species of insect, which means it can eat quite a bit. Now, when I say quite a bit, if you were to just provide it with mixed food waste, you're, you're basically going to get almost 100% bioconversion. There's, there's a 5% residual of undigested residue that builds up that's just stuff that they don't eat, mostly with lignin and hemicellulose and some other indigestible materials. But for the most part, they eat almost all the food scraps. Um, when people ask me what particular food scraps, things with calories they like. So you're not going to get huge growth of grub colonies or bioconversion feeding them celery and cilantro and, you know, uber hippie food. It's just not going to happen. You need to give them bad American diets Where that have a lot of calories. I, Things that make Americans grow big make grubs grow big. So here's and, a I got a question on that note. So what about giving them kefir or the cheese off your kefir? I would say they try. Uh, my, my guess is they will probably eat it. Um, I've noticed they, they will um, digest just about anything. The things I've noticed don't get eaten are things that are probably not surprised, like mammal bones, you know, the heavy mammalian bones, citrus rinds. I've noticed they won't eat anything paper related because it's lignin. They won't eat wood, cardboard, none of that. Um, Eggshells do not get digested. Um, let's see, what else can I think of that doesn't get eaten in a pod? That's kind of it. Everything else just tends to disappear. Chicken bones and other soft type of bones, they don't get broken down quickly by um, the grubs, um, ravenous diet, but I notice they do disappear over time, uh, Steve. So my thought, my, I'm concluding that the acidity of the pod is probably breaking it down and the microbes are assisting with that, it's, which is why they disappear. But the thick mammal bones, they don't disappear. Um, if you put roadkill in there, you're going you're gonna to see the bones uh, uh, persist. But uh, mixed food waste is great. I also make it... Um, clear to people when I go over set up and operations with them that I now provide a substrate when I set up any type of pod, whether it's a do-it-yourself pod or one of our pods. And that substrate is made up of one or two things, either coffee, uh, bur um, coffee grounds or brewer's mash. The brewery waste and coffee grounds act as a substrate. And when you feed a pod daily, and they're eating almost all the food you put in there, they need a refuge to go hide in. And if you don't provide that, they're like little minnows out of water and there's no place for them to go hide and scurry because they don't like light. Providing um, the coffee grounds and brewer waste allows that um, tendency to go hide um, to be fulfilled. One thing about those two um, substrates is they're also readily eaten by the grubs. So you're not only providing them a safe refuge and a substrate, you're providing them some nourishment. In fact, if you just keep coffee grounds that are moist next to your pod, they'll get infested with black soldier flies, which is awesome. But um, it, it, there's many reasons why I won't go into it that a substrate I've found is um, useful. But let's just say it, it, it helps provide the refuge and moisture balance. Also, those materials aren't readily compressible, Steve. So it's difficult to get anaerobic pockets in the, in the coffee grounds. Um, that natural non-compressibility um, keeps it kind of porous and open matrix. Uh, the grubs themselves do a lot of churning and mixing and bring in oxygen because of their tunneling, but the coffee grounds do assist with maintaining aerobic conditions. Um, 
I uh, always use them now to set up a pod. In fact, I use an entire five gallon bucket on the big pods. I have, I have a question. Uh, I'm I'm new to this side of things. I've been following, you know, Stephen. I just took his class. In case anybody's out there wondering if it's worth going and taking that class, get your butt over there. It's totally worth it. It was, it was just an awesome weekend uh, learning all those things. And something that came up when they were going over to the uh, worm bin, where they're doing the uh, they put some fish products in there and some other things like that. They said they don't use mammalian. Uh, waste things in there. Uh, does this fact that you're giving maybe mammalian food and stuff it doesn't affect Steve's uh, high, uh, fish ponic stuff because you're just eating the grubs, you're not then putting all the soil kind of things back in there? Um, let me ask a question. This class, was it red worms or earthworms perhaps? Yep, there are red worms and earthworms. Okay, they don't have the digestive enzymes necessary to, to readily break down uh, meat, meat waste, and, and dairy and fats. This species do. They're completely different arthropods. Yep. Uh, segmented annelids are limited on what they can eat. Uh, this particular species is part of Diptera, which is the order of, of uh, Insecta. And uh, Diptera is the flies. So if you've noticed, house flies can just eat about everything. This species actually is better at consuming and bioconversion than a house fly believe it or not. Nice. Uh, but think, that's, yeah, they're different species. They can eat a lot more. I, I, I will tell you this, Tommy. Earthworms and redworms take a lot longer to bioconvert waste. The, the speed of black soldier fly is so alarmingly fast that you honestly think when you've added the food waste that somebody went in and stole the food waste overnight. Because you just can't believe that it disappeared that quickly. I had a friend of mine who had a problematic groundhog that no longer was a problem in their garden. <laughs> the, the, the carcass got placed in the pod, and they contacted me, Carl, could a groundhog crawl out of one of the big pods. And I'm like, why do you ask me that? He's like, well, I put in a groundhog and it disappeared. So I went over there in a few days, poked around and found the skull. It had eaten it down to nothing in a matter of one to two days. And he couldn't believe that it was that quick. And I, I almost am so skeptical that I've actually gone out and done time-lapse photography because I can't believe it eats, they eat this fast, but they do. Now I'm just surprised when they don't eat something. And so when I don't see, Tommy, them eating quickly, I'm thinking maybe something's wrong, you know, a temperature issue, maybe a chemical that's in the food waste, or perhaps um, some other parameter that's out of bounds. So, you'll find that this uh, species is a lot faster, gets the attention of kids a lot easier because they almost can see the mini piranhas at work. Um, right. Even though they don't bite and they don't, they don't eat living flesh and they don't have teeth to hurt you, um, their speed is very similar. Oh. I, think, I think his question was that, do they break down stuff like E. coli or salmonella? Is, it, is that... Food um, hazard people, issue. You know, uh, Tommy, uh, and, you know, and then you can introduce it to the fish river. You know, and that, that's what I was heard of the concern of some of the mammalian stuff that you didn't want to get it in the fish river that Steve works with. To answer that, and I missed that portion of the question, I apologize. Um, I was told, Steve, that, and Tommy, that they do consume the pathogens in there, and the pathogen. Um, as a percentage, decline and decrease. However, it's not eliminated. Just like um, there's always going to be microbes on the surface of the black soldier flies that don't get consumed, there's absolutely no way to bring it down to zero. If you are concerned about a pathogen on, let's say, spoiled food that could potentially impact your fish or chickens, I tell people to just 
cook the grubs. Just like you would cook chicken. And just cook them. And, you know, you can put them in the oven. You can put them in the microwave. You can cook them. You can boil them. You can do just about any way, anything you want. I would say if there are germs there, Tommy, my gut feeling is that they're on the outside because you just can't eliminate it. There's yeah. just no way. Um, and I think it's better to be on the safe side. Now, that being said, I don't know many people that take their mature grubs from their bucket and immediately cook them. Most people just feed it directly to their chickens and fish without too much in incident. But if you want to be cautious and err on the side of safety, especially if you're going to be feeding tilapia to restaurants, you might want to make sure that there is no chance of contamination. Just like, you know, it's okay to drink raw milk. There are going to be examples of raw milk that are dangerous and infected. Okay, cool. Yeah. Appreciate it. Awesome. We had a, a question from Chad. It says, uh, they are, more for getting, are they more for getting rid of uh, waste, or, uh, or do they make fertilizer also, or is it just for total consumption? Like, do they consume everything, and, or do they do have, like, a byproduct similar to worm casings? For, for mixed food waste, uh, the undigested residue as a percentage of volume it is about 5%. If you were to start feeding it things that are lower in nutrient content, like crap, let's say you're put in cow poop, there's a buildup of 20 to 25% of undigested residue. I mean, the reason crap is crap is because there's not much left in it. It's crap. So there's not a lot of nutrient and energy in it. So of course, there's going to be more undigested, undigestible residue. So you'll get more um, material at the bottom, but it's not compost per se. Uh, compost takes weeks to months to make and is primarily um, the byproduct of microbes. Black soldier fly eat faster than the microbes do. And so the whole goal of managing a, a pod or a do-it-yourself uh, colony is to make sure you're maintaining conditions that favor grub digestion over microbe digestion. So in that respect, you're looking at a finished product of, of grubs, not necessarily undigested residue. Again, I don't like to say compost because it's not compost. I always tell people, this is great to get rid of waste, um, but really it's great to produce a nutritious biomass in the form of grubs. If you want to use the undigested residue that's accumulating, that also has castings mixed in and a little bit of compost because some microbes are working in there, I would say take all of that material and move it to a vermiculture bed, primar primarily red worms. The stuff that doesn't get eaten by grubs just happens to be loved by red worms because there's a lot of lignin in there. So you're going to get a pre-digested material that is loved by red worms and in fact will allow your red worms to produce castings a little bit faster. And it also serves as a way to get rid of that waste buildup. Um, I do know that people will take that undigested residue, mix it with shredded cardboard and a little bit of grit for some added bonus to help the worms because they like cardboard and uh, they need grit for the digestion, so a little sand. Um, I've seen people in Hawaii doing that. I do it when I'm really, really bored, um, but other people just take the undigested material and bury it. It's, it. It needs to be finished off and composted or converted. And, you know, if you have a worm bin, go that route because it's going to be faster than the normal food waste in your worm bin. Awesome. Now, I, yeah. I've seen sometimes people's bins, they have uh, sometimes little mites, like red mites or white mites. Is that something that you occasionally come across? Or? Um, I have seen many different types of mites in pods. I have not seen a circumstance where the mites have been detrimental to a functioning pod. Uh, I assume in a pod that's not working prob 
properly, you may have an infestation that's actually uh, harming the, the grubs, but I haven't seen that. Um, there are mites associated with many, many insects in a symbiotic relationship that they just kind of live together. Um, most of the mites that I see infesting um, pods are usually in there to just eat some of the food waste or um, break down waste, but they're usually not targeting grubs. I would love to find out if there are. I haven't seen that, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Very, very cool. So what are some of the pro problems you see people that run into or, you know, uh, you know, um, having having sold uh, and dealt with a bunch of these, uh, what's some of the stuff that you've seen people maybe more common, or maybe some some of the weirder, wackier things you've seen? If they're if you don't, um, really have... I can go over the major pro problems I've seen over the years. Um, first of all, it's a very easy species to maintain. It's actually easier than in in than most insects because of um, their wide uh, digestive enzyme profile, but also their their pretty hardy. They're much less persnickety than redworms and earthworms, and they're definitely easier than bees. Um, but there are limitations onto their abilities. Uh, the zones of death, I call it, are if your colony starts to go over, you know, 107 to 110, they're going to die. The insects just can't do real much after 110, and they just croak. Um, I don't really see much grub activity below 65, even though they're, they'll live and they'll be hardy down into the 50s, you won't see much activity. They're almost sluggish. You know, they're, they're cold-blooded, so of course they're going to be. Adults are much less hardy than uh, the grubs, and just like most seasonal insects that you see flying around, the flies, the bees, the butterflies, you're not going to see them when it gets cold. And so you, you tend to get die off of the adults in um, the later parts of autumn. So I do see problems with pods associated with temperature. In the Southwest, I get reports where their pods go over 110, they just die off. If it's too cold, they're going to be more of an arrested arrest development, but it won't kill them. My pods go down into the 50s in the late fall, sometimes in the 40s at night, and they're still in there and they're active. When it warms back up, I feed them and they're just as robust. It doesn't kill them. Um, I do see moisture issues being a problem with some people. They um, tend to, um, in the Southwest especially, in other drier climates, not put enough moisture in and you don't get good crawl off because it because of it and there's less bioconversion. So you have to maintain kind of a, an oatmeal type consistency where it's more or less constantly moist. And by the way, those substrates help with moisture balance. I would say that it's easier to let your pod dry out than it is to overly wet them. When they're overly wet, they tend to, the liquid tends to just drain out and drip through the drainage. So you almost can't give it too much moisture. Um, another problem is anaerobicity or stagnant pockets. The substrates help with this, but let's say somebody doesn't use a substrate or they're not spreading the waste that they add every day uh, evenly. You'll get a pocket like a clump of bugu gai pan from the Chinese restaurant that you got their waste from. And that pocket of waste just accumulates in the corner it's not being mixed, it just starts to anaerobically decay from the inside out. The grubs aren't in there and the microbes that produce odor are taking over and dominating, causing stink. So I do notice when people start neglecting their pod and not listening to their nose, you'll get odor. I always tell people oxygen is the, the great, you know, freer of bad smell and you just gotta go in with one of those little hippie claws and break up the clumps of anaerobic conditions and mix in the substrate and you'll tend to, to um, bring back uh, aerobic conditions and mitigate the smells. Um, also, when your drainage is clogged and the liquids start to back up, there's nothing like warm food waste on a hot environment sitting in water to produce a smell. 
<laughs> so you always want to make sure drainage is occurring. I mean, food waste is like 65% water. So you're going to get a lot of liquid waste through digestion. So you got to have it be able to drain as quickly and as easily as possible. And a lot of people in their homemade do-it-yourself kits, they don't produce, they don't uh, think about the drainage. You just get stink because of liquid buildup. So, so those are the three problems I normally see. Smell, um, temperature issues, and uh, moisture issues. Do you have uses uh, for, that, for that juice that comes out of the bottom of the, the bug container, the pod? Um, I have some interesting personalities who swear by that stuff as the elixir of their success and their prize peppers or their prize something that they're growing. I have found it personally not useful, so I let it drain into the ground below. I just make sure to locate my pod on a porous surface so it falls into the mulch below and into the ground. And it, you know, it provides nutrients to whatever's growing near it, in my case, grapes. Uh -huh. I will say this, I did find one particular use that I still use the, li the liquid effluent for, and I don't call it tea because it's, it's an effluent. I do save a mason jar full every year, Tommy, uh, wide mouth, not regular mouth, because you can freeze wide mouth. You go putting water in a regular mouth uh, mason jar and you put it in the freezer, it's gonna crack. So make sure it's wide mouth. But anyway, I save maybe a, a pint of that every year and I use that to, um, it, I guess you call it inoculate my pod in the spring. That odor seems to attract uh, the pregnant females faster than just the food waste alone. And I mix it into the substrate food waste mixture in the spring. And, you know, then I'll, I'll, I'll save another quart or two pints or whatever um, that year and then freeze that. So that I have found is being useful. Other people think um, they can use it on their garden. I personally think the microbial activity is so high, Tommy, that there is the potential to have bad pathogens mixed in that came in on your food waste. You can't have food waste that doesn't have bad pathogens. It's not easy because uh, most food waste is not sterile. So you don't ferment, say, you wouldn't ferment it or anything like that. I would say it's probably stupid to take that liquid and spray it on your salad greens. If you wanted to put it dilute maybe on certain acid-loving plants, like your rhododendrons and azaleas, I don't think it's, you're going to have a problem with that. It's probably going to be beneficial, but more or less the acidic loving plants. Cool. I'm loving yeah, cool. stuff. Great. <laughs> Remember, Tommy, managing waste and collecting the liquid effluent is one more thing that you have to do. And if you don't have to do it and you just let it drain into the ground below, it just frees up your time. So I try to tell people don't over don't overly engineer these or it'll drive you crazy. Well, I'm already crazy and I'm also a cheap bastard. So I'm always looking for, okay, we have this thing over here and is the juice that's coming out of that, is there something in there that we want, you know, and, and it's there, you know, that's why this is how I look at stuff. I don't know. Well, if, if you're cheap, you should be using your urine as fertilizer as I do. Um, I would suggest this. In the spring, when you have your garden planted, take a couple pepper plants and try some dilute effluent on some and not others and compare them all after two months. See just, rem change. just remember, you know, alcohol-based urine was very good because it also feeds your acetobacters. There you go. Um, I don't you, could, you, could write off your, you could write off your beer as fertilizer, you know. There you go. You know, it only takes a, uh, a creative accountant these days. <laughs> Till you get caught. It's a tax deduction. Um, what else, Steve? What else, Tommy? Oh, so we had a um, question from Chad. This is, do ants, uh, what happens if you get ants in your bin? Ants are the biggest problem I've ever seen uh, for pods. Um, I have been lucky in that I have not personally had a lot of ant problems. I think I had it once. For some reason, um, I just don't get it. But if you do, um, there are a couple things that you can 
try that will help. I keep all of my pods elevated normally on cinder blocks. You can put diatomaceous earth around the cinder blocks, usually with boric acid mixed in. Um, you can put tack gel type materials, which is like a almost like a Vaseline that surrounds the, the elevation points. Um, a water moat is useful for ants, but then incentivizes mosquitoes. So I, I try to dissuade people from doing the water moats, um, especially in the South, because in a few days you get mosquitoes. Um, controlling ants from their source is also a method or an approach, but um, I don't know if there's a foolproof way of controlling ants, only because we all still have them, <laughs> no matter what we do. I like and, grit. Uh, there's, there's, what is it? There's like 18 times the weight of ants on the earth as there are weight of humans. If you just look at biomass. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they're taking into account the Walmart humans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, that, that might be a, a race there. Um, I would say. Very part of YouTube, yeah. Yeah, I would say you can only mitigate against ants. You're not going to really prevent it. But the Vaseline type materials to coat the surfaces, um, you got to just be able to prevent their entry. And that is a good way of doing it. I would not recommend using any pesticides near the pods because uh, I've been told by entomologists that the adult flies are actually quite sensitive to, to harmful chemicals. How about uh, things like a talc? I think uh, I was watching this guy who uh, raises ants, it's like it's his thing. And around the top of all of his colonies, he has a dusting of uh, a talc powder. And the ants apparently just hate it. And even very aggressive ant species that he keeps, you know, because he keeps them as pets, he can keep very, what you consider dangerous ants if they are. Uh, in his colonies with that dusting of uh, powder. Uh, you know, I'll have to try that. I have not tried talcum powders. Just off the shelf, or does he have a special brand or mixture? Uh, I was just looking into it. I didn't study it or anything. Sorry, I don't have the answer. I just uh, was thinking of, of barriers, and that's that's what his was go -to it, thing is. is was, it it boric, was it borax and not talcum? Borax is a real good one. Yeah, well, yeah. works real great. The other one is vas like he was talking about Vaselina. Vaseline. I've kept, I've kept huge roach colonies, um, in in a you know open top aquariums, uh, no problem. And in fact, he's seen, even seen one of them. You're, you got my. I gave uh, Carl his roaches uh, for his his colony to get him started. I used to re breed a ton of them, so. So you mentioned um, using diatomaceous earth and boric acid. Why are you adding, you know, at the, around the bottom, of course, I was funny because I was thinking about your worms. You can't use DE and that. But when you were doing around the bottom to keep the ants from going, what? why do you add the boric acid for people out there? The boric acid um, somehow disrupts um, the life cycle of the, of the ants. I don't know what the mechanism is. But I was told it enhances um, the, I guess, the ability of DE to do what it needs to do. But I don't know the mechanism chemically. Well, DE scratches the exoskeleton and then they dehydrate and die. Yes, so. that's what it does. It's a mechanical pesticide. Oh, really? Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Uh, I thought it was when they clean themselves uh, that insects have a super low tolerance to boron. That's well, probably that probably is what it is. Well, it's I, haven't, I haven't researched why, but uh, boric acid helps enhance the effectiveness of the diatomaceous earth. Apparently, it uh, works in tandem, but it doesn't necessarily have the same mechanism. Because uh, yeah, you're right. It, you do the ants do die of desiccation for um. Yeah, with it, it, it sounds like you're hitting them from two different directions is what yep. it really sounds like. It's not like it enhances the diatomaceous earth, but if you put DE down and then use boric acid too, you got two ways to kill them. That's what right. it sounds like. That's what I meant when I say enhances the efficacy of the material, not not so much the mechanism that how diatomaceous earth works. Um, 
Well, thanks. Well, I'm sure everybody enjoyed that. You know, figuring that out. I, I used a ton By of. By the way, I'm Roger. <laughs> I'm Roger, and I was late. Sorry about that. I had a conference. <laughs> you can't. So I've got a network I'm building. Sometimes the tech tech guys aren't available unless they're available. You better be in conference with them when they're available, or it might be a week. So, uh, but no, I, I'm Roger anyway. I didn't get your name. His his name is Carl. Oh, I'm Carl. sorry. It's Carl. Yeah. It says, it says Tar River, so I didn't want to call you Tar. So you, know, I you can call me just about yeah. anything. Tar's fine. Yeah. So, TR baby. All right. TR baby. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, was, Roger's always trying to get us in trouble every I episode. Um, I would say this if you, if, like, if, based on the frugality of probably a lot of your um, uh, listeners, I would say try out um, your own do it yourself pod maybe the first year if you've never tried Black Soldier Fly and just kind of get comfortable and knowledgeable with the life cycle and what they eat and what they prefer, you know, temperature wise, light wise, and kind of get used to it. And if it's something you think you want to pursue, then invest in one of our technologies. We could come up with a, a discount schedule for listeners uh, of your podcast and just say, okay, I heard about this through Steve's podcast. And then we'll say, oh, okay. And we'll look up and just put a discount in just like a friends and family thing. And uh, that way, um, there's kind of a little benefit for them having listened to your podcast. And that's no problem at all. Um, but I like people to, I don't, I don't like to force our technology on people. I want them to become comfortable with it. And then once they do, they kind of then can move up in um, efficiency. And I know our technology will help with that. So. Awesome. Thanks a lot. That's really cool of you. And after yeah, making yeah. cake for a year, I bet you they really appreciate your system when they finally get it. <laughs> they do. A lot of the do it yourself has <laughs> gone into real issues yeah. with what, what, So, uh, aside from the black soldier flies, what other insects have you been raising or keeping? And I know you have a, a, a website and stuff. And what are some of the other, uh, other um, things? You well, they're not on our website, but I personally raise um, mealworms. They're just about the easiest thing on the planet to raise. And uh, of course, uh, the hissers, the hissing cockroaches, the Madagascar roaches, they're both a lot of fun. Um, I will want to pursue getting um, some walking sticks in the future. Probably the, one, the, probably the uh, ones from Malaysia that are, um, uh, what is it, parthenocarpic? Is that the right word? So the, the live bearers ones? Yeah, that are, they can be, they're all females and they don't need a male to mate. I think it's called parthenogenesis. I think um, you're right. And uh, that would be nice, especially as a way to, uh, instead of buying gifts for people, I like to give gifts like either plants or, or insects as colonies as gifts. It seems more real. So. And they're cute. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> The, we had a question, a guy uh, in chat asked, uh, would it be bad to put diatomaceous earth in your worm bin? I would not do that yeah. because it'll probably get in there. Uh, the chitin, a soft exoskeleton, it'll get in between their segments and probably cause desiccation. Yep, yep, definitely. They, in, in fact, it tells you, you know, that the only way you can use, no, there is a thing about the, the, when I was researching it originally, one thing I did find, they said, if you wanted to use DE in conjunction with worms in some kind of situation, um, you would have to put it on the top and let the worms work it into the soil themselves. You wouldn't be able to mix it in like you would if you don't want any bugs at all, if you want everything just done. But I still would see, I agree. Because uh, I'm a big proponent of diatomaceous earth. Uh, it's one of the things that'll get rid of spider mites, and uh, it works. Because I've never had spider mites since I used it, and never again. And uh, probably because there's still remnants in the room. But um, yeah, I would never put it in with worms because like uh, the whole point is it basically, for the layman's terms, it scratches their body. They then, then dehydrate and die, and then the eggs hatch, and they come out, and they crawl through it, and they dehydrate, they get scratched, and they dehydrate and die. So it's probably not a good idea, uh, as Carl says, uh, or anybody else would tell you, it's probably not a good idea to use DE in the worm bins or anything else you want to keep alive that's crawling around, like benefits.
artificial insects or anything. It'll kill them. I mean, basically, it's just microscopic glass particles. Yeah. And uh, kind of, yeah. It's a fossil shell polar. It's 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 fossilized insects that they found in a quarry and it's dug up in I don't know, Montana or somewhere like that. And it's just got to, it's just it's full of nutrients and minerals. It's like you can eat it. You, it's in food that, uh, in our grocery stores. You can feed it to your dogs. It will rid dogs, animals, of uh, and humans of all your parasites that are in your intestines and all. We all have parasites, whether you like it or not. It, if you eat some DE, you put it in some yogurt, it. and you put I a tablespoon of uh, yogurt, uh, eat it, free clean free it free out. Free. You feel like you got all kinds of energy then. You know. Sorry. But I love that stuff. Yeah, no, he's he's spot on. I, I will say this: it's not an insect a skeleton; it's actually an algae. Yep. An algae? Well, okay. Well, I read it as a as a, a fossilized insect. Kind of a like a phytoplankton. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's like little little sea creatures and plankton and yeah. and all the algae. Okay. Well, yeah, that's all. That's why all the minerals come from, right? Plankton yep. and all that good stuff from the ocean. All right, so I'll, I'll have to go read up a little bit more. I just know it works, and I've used it, and I quit researching it. So thanks for uh, cluing me in that I'm a little wanting on my explanation of what it is. Isn't it true that diatomaceous earth uh, also messes with thoracic breathers? I can't tell you that myself. I know that you don't want to, well, I know one thing, people, well, while we're on the topic, you want to make sure when we're mentioning diatomaceous earth, let's maybe, let's get straight right here. Do not use pool grade, commercial, pool grade industrial diatomaceous earth that's toxic, and it, it's, it will mess with your um, respiratory system and stuff like that. Make sure you, you get food grade codex diatomaceous earth. Do not yes, buy very pool true. grade filtering diatomaceous earth that's a big warning for you guys out there and and i don't know if that uh, but you you reminded me tommy of that thank you for your question i'm not sure if that helped you or not but you you uh you can ingest this stuff so i wouldn't want to snort it or anything but um you can eat it so if you can eat it and, and i've eaten it and i've given it to my dogs and and we all loved it and it does work to get rid of bugs you know the pests that crawl around oh Okay, technically it's a protist. I just looked it up. The diatoms are protists. So awesome. anyway, specific diatoms and fights. Chrysophytes? are uh, golden algae. Golden algae. Right. Very cool. So you you're saying you raise mealworms. You want to talk about that a little bit and what you use them for? Oh uh, well, my friend Gina said, Carl, I want some of your cockroaches. I said well, what are you going to do for me? And she said, well, I have mealworms. Oh. And so being the biologist I am, of course, I'll take that over other trading opportunities. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I've had these in stir fry. I've noticed they're really readily loved by everything from bearded dragons to, you know, certain, uh, fish species in aquaria. And so I thought, you know what, let me go ahead and see if I can take a crack at this. It turned out to be really easy. I, I hydrate them exclusively with carrots and I feed them either um, oat or wheat brand, oat or wheat brand or um, uh, steel cut oats. I always get them on sale for a dollar for a big thing of it and so it's real cheap. And um, I use those little trays of plastic drawers i just cut out the bottoms and put in uh kind of like a screen that's similar to your window screens in your windows and i just glue that to the bottom and the eggs fall out into trays below and i make sure there's food down there they're really easy to grow uh i keep them in you know between 70 and 80 degrees and uh that's pretty cool I, you know what? I, they're really easy. I did find out that they're not um, incapable of flying and, and don't necessarily have just a fused, uh, I guess you call it, wing area. They actually can fly. They just choose not to in most circumstances. But apparently they can fly. I've, I've never seen one actually fly, though. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have. 
No, I've never seen them play either. I raised them <laughs> in a pet trade, so that's they're that's fun funny. to grow, aren't they? Do you have any tips about growing them that you've learned that could benefit others? Um, the only thing we did, we used sweet potatoes instead of carrots. Um, they seemed to like the sweet potatoes and the little bit of sugar seemed to speed them up a little bit, but that was about it. Oh, good to know. Okay. Uh, and you do them raw too, right? The raw sweet potato? Yeah, you would just go buy the you know bag of sweet potatoes or whatever at the store. Last us the whole month or whatever. <laughs> Do you feed them all? Do you feed them all fresh from the store, or do you let it uh, decay some? Oh no, no! You, you cut them up. Usually, you chop them into quarters or something. It makes it easier for them to eat. And then right. you toss it. You know, maybe toss two or three in there a day if you don't have other stuff to feed them. You know, usually you got other stuff. You know, cleaning a bunch of the algae. Or we take the planted aquarium plants and and trim those sometimes and give them to you know give them some some fresh greens or whatever just to give them something diverse. Have you heard through the latest studies with mealworms that they will actually bioconvert and consume styrofoam? I saw that. I thought that was really crazy. I didn't even know there was a species on the planet that can actually eat styrofoam. Wow. That, that they can actually sense. digest it. I, I couldn't believe it. Wow. I need some mealworms. <laughs> I mean, think about how much of that builds up in the landfill. And uh, <laughs> yeah. just with humanity. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, yeah, that's I, I mean, I haven't tested it to see what rate of consumption it is, but throw some packing peanuts in there and see what happens. <laughs> interesting. It's interesting how the hell they found that out. Right. Well, what would be the so back end side of that? Would they? Wouldn't they be? Uh, wouldn't they be possibly contaminated at that point? To be used as, as such for food or, uh, you know, whatever? That was my main question, uh, Roger, that I asked in my head. And the article answers it later on about there's no biological functional difference in the grub after consuming it. Huh. Just like when you have coffee or tea or some of the crap that you buy at the supermarket, like those synthetic soft drinks, you're still Roger. <laughs> And but, but jacked up. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I, I mean, I guess it gets broken down into the molecular components of probably a, a carbohydrate or some type of simple sugar is my guess, because aren't they just all polymers, a lot of plastics? So, yeah, basically. Mostly, yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're a byproduct of, um, of uh, petroleum. And right. I mean, it's interesting that they that they have an enzyme that can break that molecular bond in the plastic. That's, that's fascinating. That's, yeah, not damage them. That's what real. I still wouldn't necessarily believe that it doesn't damage them at all. But Roger, you know, well, what I think I my curiosity yeah, was: Are there microbes doing this in tandem, sort of like you know, um, what do you call those things that eat wood? Um, termites don't actually do the eating of the wood. The microbes in their gut does. So I'm wondering if there's a, a microbial synergy going on here. Yeah. And then well, they, you know, finding that microbe, would that taking that microbe out and treating the styrofoam waste be more uh, that's, efficient? Who knows? Yeah, I know. That's, that's you know, like we said, we're all kind of blown back that you even found that, that they can do that or this just recently come out. That's, I thought it was one of those clickbait fake news articles i actually did <laughs> yeah exactly so we, we're gonna have to read about read about this for a while <laughs> and no it was really legit and i guess steve came across one too oh you did you did yeah yep yeah. so that's that's my two cents about interesting mealworm stories um <laughs> what about your roaches what are you doing for your roaches and then i can talk a little bit on um, I sell them on nextdoor.com to my neighborhood for like presents at the holidays. Kids want the <laughs> colonies for gifts, and I tend to just give the colonies away as well. Must suck coming to your house for Halloween, huh? Not Halloween. It tends to be Christmas time, but um, we're we're very remote uh, where I live, Roger, and nobody in their right mind is going to go down our driveway on Halloween. Yeah, they don't come to my house either. But that was actually Tommy. But yeah, they don't come down my road either. You know, they they I'm the scary guy in the neighborhood. So well, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with scary. Um, 
in a collapse scenario, in a collapse scenario, Roger, probably people are going to avoid you. <laughs> yeah, that's the you got that whole thing going on. Yeah, well, that's I think cool. You, because when, when I have the food and I'm growing, when the lights go out and I'm growing my food, I hope they stay away. Yeah, yeah well, you just got to be below the radar. Yeah, I always liked at the pet store. I'd put four or five of them on my wrist with a long sleeve shirt on, and grab <laughs> something and plop my hand on the counter and just let them crawl out from under, underneath my my long yeah. sleeve and oh man you were so funny especially around halloween where you just scratch your head maybe i have one i put it in my hair especially with the dreads and this big giant hissing cockroach comes crawling out of your hair people freak <laughs> out it is too funny that That's is crazy. hysterical <laughs> uh, i remember That's in crazy. that movie with um uh what was the movie with uh men in black yep, where the, um the guy had roaches coming out of his sleeve yep those were hissers. Yep. <laughs> now, did I just give you hissers, or did I also give you some dubias as well? I think you, you just, just gave me hissers. hissers. Hey, have, you, <laughs> have you eaten the hissers yet? I heard they're delectable. I, I haven't. I have, I've never actually eaten roaches. I've eaten giant beetle larvae when I was in South America. They're like big grubs, and they were pretty good. Uh, they eat like some kind of palm or fruit wood or something like that, and they were super tasty. Um, I'd totally eat those again, but I've never actually eaten the hissers. I know what's cool is delectable. The the hissers are crazy. Like you, if you feed them a ton every once in a while, so there's always like a king of the tank. There's a male that ends up larger than the others. They have like almost like a saltwater fish, like damselfish or whatever, where the, the the you have the male and female, and the male is always the biggest, or the the male is the second biggest fish, and then the the main breeding fe sexually mature female is the largest fish, and then all the ones that are smaller than the, those two is, is like sexually subservient, and they don't reproduce. And then if one of them dies, one of them will, sometimes the male will switch to female and instantly get a growth spurt, and the next largest one will rise and replace the male, and it's pretty trippy. Um, but roaches will do something similar where they'll have the it's called like the king of the of the colony, and he'll be large. But every once in a blue moon, um, they'll fight and have this huge swarm. And I have literally had it on the other end of the house and woke me up at night because of all the churning they're doing uh, after uh, you know a big battle between two of them, where it just pisses off all the other ones, and all of them start hissing. And you'd be surprised <laughs> the decibel level when they actually do that whole sorting out their pecking order. It's loud as fuck. And, and, you know, you'd be really, really surprised at just how wow, ridiculously loud it is. Wow, you probably make the money selling that as a ringtone. <laughs> I just, it, it, I've, I've heard it five or six times now, and it's just, it always amazes me. But you can raise thousands of them together. Like, I had a 30-gallon a tank with just a band of Vaseline around the top, and we had yeah. at least 2,000 roaches in there, and we had, that was kept right in the kitchen. What we do is just scrape the plate side off into it, and, you know, when we needed to feed the monitors or feed the chickens, I'd just scrape a bunch out and dump it in their tank, or I'd scrape a bunch out and throw it in, the, in a Ziploc. Um, yeah, usually put crazy. a piece of, the easiest way to harvest them is to get a piece of pipe um, uh, you know, a cut piece of pipe, I mean, usually one inch pipe or half inch pipe. One inch pipe is usually the best. You can get a stick of one inch pipe with a pipe cutter for like $4 uh, at the store and cut it up. Um, and just cut, make yourself little tubes. They'll crawl in there and, and they're happy to live in there. You just pop them out, shake them off into your Ziploc, close the Ziploc up, throw it in the freezer for half an hour, stuns all the roaches or kills them in most cases. Uh, and then dump them into your fish tank. This way you don't have to worry about them swimming across the top of the water and running off into your grow room. Uh, Steve, I need to excuse myself for one no second. I will be right back. You guys, let me give you a topic. How about entomophagy? Talk about <laughs> yourself. Be right back. <laughs> I love it, man. You're shit. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's one of my favorite speakers. I've seen him talk on two separate occasions, and he's just oh. he's so knowledgeable and, and knows so many different intricacies on all this stuff. It's really cool to talk, hear him speak, uh, hear him talk on can you would you reintroduce him now since I was late and maybe late oh, yeah. to reintroduce his, our dad? His name is Carl Warkowski. He's um, developed a he's a really cool um, black soldier fly product called the Biopod, um, yeah. and you can get it on was it Tar River? I think his Tar River Trading Post. Uh, there's a link in the description for those of you who are interested. He also has a bunch of other survival and prep stuff and and other things and. Uh, yeah, he's a really cool guy. I got a chance to to, to get to know him at the at the convention that we both spoke at. So, Andy also announced tonight that anybody that listens to the podcast will get a discount. 
Yeah, we'll have a little uh, discount code we'll put in the description there, and uh, um, yeah, it'll be it'll be cool so that you guys will have a, a discount if you decide to buy one. We'll get that website and all for you all later on in the show. You know, yep. Or we let him get away. <laughs> hey, he's back. All right. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, the one thing I wanted to mention is um, a lot of people who buy our pods are doing it to offset the growing expense of feed and not only for fish, but for their poultry, whether it's turkeys, yeah. uh, chickens, quail, whatever. Um, they're about 40% protein, about 35% fat, and they tend to be really good fats as are most fats from insects. And it's the fats and the proteins that are the expensive portion of uh, feed when you buy it. So if you can offset the expensive part of feed and then let your chickens or poultry pasture, you really can save a lot of money, you know, mentioning frugality earlier, by, by pursuing this methodology of, uh, of feed production. I, I tell people to try to follow the golden rule of poultry feed. And this was told to me by an old timer in the South a couple years ago, and I've never forgot it. And he said, just follow the golden rule of three. And I said, well, what's that? He said, break up your feed or chicken food into three, three components. One third greens or grasses, basically anything in the pasture. One third seeds or grains, basically, you know, leftover corn and uh, sunflowers and whatever else you can produce on the homestead, amaranth, uh, milo, millet, and then one third critters. And those critters basically are, are bugs and insects and black soldier fly definitely satisfy that one third critters. And you know what, over time you can be almost 100% self-reliant on uh, feed, especially if you're thinking about wanting to be you know, off grid and not have to go to tractor supply once a week. So I wanted to throw that out there. It, it, this definitely is achievable on being 100% off, I guess you call it the feed grid, which is, you know, one of those traps. Um, what did they do 100 years ago? They didn't go to the store to buy chicken feed. They just let their chickens out. <laughs> they were self-substantial. Right. So I wanted to just mention that, that there's there, a sustainable component of all this is just getting off the feed grid and trying to be more self-reliant. And I think it follows the tenets of permaculture, which I know Steve um, believes in as well. And I wanted to just emphasize that. And I had forgotten to mention it earlier. So I actually... Like Marty would have been nuts tonight, man. Where's yep. Marty? I mean, but go Marty, on. I didn't, I didn't Marty, want to go on. Marty is always the one doing, doing insects. He had a... Uh, some yeah, yeah. that came up tonight he wasn't able to join us um so i had a question on that note how would someone do a large scale setup for this say someone is a big farm and they want to do a bunch of chickens or they have maybe you know two or three aquaponic greenhouses and want to do a bigger scale uh raise uh, i've seen a couple of interesting youtube videos and like greenhouse type setups so what kind of what would you recommend or suggest for that kind of scenario um each each law i wouldn't recommend the small pods unless you have a small backyard flock or just a very small aquaponic system. The, the small pods are made more or less designed for residential use. If you have a, a scaled environment where you need larger quantities of feed, I tell people go with the bigger pods. They take up a four by four space, which is 16 square feet. So you got to allocate space for it. And you have to have the ability to dump in waste. And uh, you can normally find space uh, in most greenhouse settings that are designed right now for aquaculture or maybe hydroponics or aquaponics. The problem is you have to remember that 110 threshold temperature. Sometimes greenhouses get hotter than that. You can actually kill the, the pod. You can let the life cycle of the adult and that portion, which is normally coming in from nature, be done inside the hoop house or greenhouse and you don't have to have even inputs from nature. So there is an advantage by having a climate controlled setting with aquaponics uh, be able to expend into um, bioconversion of grubs. I will say that 
a good ratio of, of feed is one big pod is kind of the equivalent to 30 chickens, adult chickens, based on that golden rule of a third, a third, and a third. And um, that's a good ratio to go. I, I have about 40 chickens that I oversee and two pods is more than enough and gives me ample to freeze for the winter months. So do you actually do you want to talk uh, talk a little bit about that and then I had a, a question too uh, about um actually yeah talk a little bit about that and then I'll, I'll ask my question. Uh sure. Um well as as our most seasonal part um production on farms whether it's corn, tomatoes, any annual uh, black soldier fly for people who do this outdoors it's seasonal. And so you want to produce more than you need at that season and you can preserve it many ways. You can dehydrate it, you can desiccate it or dry it. Um, uh, you know, there's freeze drying, dehydrating, there's de dehydration in the sun, there's dehydration in a dehydrator. There's many approaches for that. You can also freeze it. Um, I personally think the easiest thing for me to do is to take the grubs that harvest off, put them in a Ziploc and throw the Ziploc in your freezer. Um, just make sure to warn your significant other that there are frozen <laughs> bugs in the bugs in it because they can look like the blueberries. <laughs> and she don't want to open those blueberries and put it in the, you know, the, in, in the, the mixed drink. Um, so I would say go with the quart bags, not the gallon bags, because a gallon bag of grubs is heavy and a quart bag is more manageable. And you know, you put maybe 10, 15, 20 of those away. It's really easy to do. Most people who are homesteaders have some type of greenhouse. I'm not a greenhouse, uh, a freezer. Freezers. Yeah. Um, but anyway, overshoot your needs and then you have extras just like you do when you can tomatoes or any type of crop. You just have more than you need and therefore you have stuff in the cooler months. You're not, you're not forced to buy so much feed. The same goes with the other components of that third, the third, a third. In many climates, there are still green things that grow, even in the winter months, and there are still um, uh, seed-based plants like grains that you can overwinter in piles, like sunflower heads or corn that just can just be saved. And you can just peel that off and throw it in the chickens in the winter. Same with sunflower heads or amaranth heads. You just got to be creative. Um, I just want people to try to overshoot production in regards to uh, capacity. And uh, that way you have stuff over the winter. Awesome. Now I had a, a question. I think I asked you this back when I met you, but I don't remember what the answer was. So do they require um, like vitamin or UVA or UVB or anything like that to finish their life cycle or that, you know, so can you raise them completely inside that container with the lid closed and then never getting exposed to light or um, could, do they have to have some light exposure or sunlight exposure or do I, do I need a certain light bulb? That was something that was uh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, in order for the breeding and mating to occur, you need sunlight or certain wavelengths. If it's if you're completely underground in some bunker, specifically it's UVB, but most greenhouses that I'm aware of have sunlight somehow getting in. And so you really don't need to provide um, additional lighting. If you have a full spectrum bulb, chances are the UV component is in there that you need. Um, and that way you don't have to look for a bulb, bulb that's UV specific, uh, UVB specific. But um, they do, that. you can't do this like in a basement setting, Steve, without light. They won't mate. And if you do get mate, mating, you're probably lucky. <laughs> but um, I, I've never, I've never been, I've never heard of an example of people doing these just in their basement without any type of light. Like you could do that with earthworms and redworms, but and and other species, but not this particular species. So I guess all the, the mating, all the like little candle light and some soft music. Then, so all the all the female uh, black soldier flies are named Roxanne. You got to turn the red light on. <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
a little T5 lighting and a little, this is a bad joke. A little music well, down in the basement. Then. Well, Ro Roxanne is red light, and red light is the infrared portion of the spectrum, whereas, you know, the blue purple is more the UV. So I guess that's true. The a, true nerd, a true nerd goes off onto the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We, yeah, love, we love that. We love that. Yep. Well, yeah. We yeah. Talk about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can know way too much. Um, no, no. <laughs> that's just not true. Yeah, that's true. The funny thing is, the more you think you know, the more you realize how little you actually do know. <laughs> Hang around this show for a few weeks. You'll find out you learn something new every week almost. Yeah, yeah, well, I think one of the tenets of permaculture is to practice reskilling. And the only way to do reskilling is to have somebody who's sufficiently knowledgeable on a subject train everyone else in the group. And I think that it helps enhance transitioning overall. And that's the best approach I've ever seen to permaculture groups is to just teach others what you know. Everybody knows something. And if you don't know something, then go learn it and then teach others. So. And then share, yeah, and then share it, yeah. Learn, and do, share. Learn do, teach. But, but be discreet with your preps. <laughs> Nobody needs to know your 18-month food supply where it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. So have you worked with any other uh, beneficial insects or any other um, advice on uh, insects? I mean, I, I, I have honey, I've had honeybees over the years. I don't have them right now. Um, they, are, they are a challenge. <laughs> They're difficult, but... They're very rewarding. Um, that's it on insects. I will partake in in um, the walking sticks in the near future, but that's it for insects for me. Very cool. Awesome. Well, you do you want to uh, do you want to mention your um, your website? The, the oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, we're Tar River Trading Post dot com. Tar River Trading Post. You can go to Facebook and like us. If People are finding out about the technology from this podcast. Please message us directly and don't order online. Because if you order online, you're going to pay the full retail. I'd rather give you a friends and family discount for having had to suffer through this podcast. And that's <laughs> got to be worth something. So uh, just message us and we'll, we'll just do it a, a manual order and manual discount and sometimes they're more fun because they involve human interaction yes i like that 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 last point is very important to me it is sometimes things like retail have become so impersonal that uh it's sometimes enjoyable when you actually talk to somebody on the phone we do on the larger uh steve on the larger pods when they're purchased um we do include a free um conference call for uh, set up and operational support. We don't want people to F it up because we really make our, our business on word of mouth on, and referrals. And so if people aren't doing it properly, then it doesn't benefit us in any way. So we found that people don't always tend to read the 30 page manual and they just want to be told what to do. So that's why we offer the free conference call. Plug and play, they want plug and play. They awesome. do. Then they yeah. want to bitch, and if they mess it up, they want to bitch about it in the feedback section. But yes, call Carl. Don't don't bitch about Carl's stuff. Call Carl, and they'll take care of you. That's what he's saying right there. Yeah, and and to yeah. tell you the truth, every climate zone and everybody's setup is is unique. So sometimes their microclimate, you know, there's certain tips and tricks I can tell them yeah. that may not be in the manual. That's a good point. Yeah, everybody's environment is different. So Slightly you're going to have different issues whenever you're trying to do anything like this. As we all know, you're going to have to adapt to your climate and your environment. A mistake people make when they go buy things like this, they don't, oh, I want to do it. They don't take any consideration into planning for uh, figuring out if they're going to actually be able to do it in their climate or their region because of the environmental issues or what they may or may not have to construct or build or mo you know modify in their environment to make it happen. So I, we run across it all the time, and that's yeah, I'm glad you brought that up so I could you know think of that. You know. I did have a hippie accountant <laughs> who bought only organic feed said he did a calculation he said the payoff on the big pods is about two and a half years somewhere between two and three years and uh 
that I tell people that because I assume his calculations as a finance guy were pretty accurate. But he told me that, and he said that was the reason he purchased it. Um, so I I have not done the calculations, but apparently the big pods are on parity with you know costs in about two or three years and pay themselves off. You know, it's important as a business standpoint to have a return on investment. You don't want just want to have money sucked out of your wallet. Well, that's true. A return on the machine, but you also have those two and a half years of all the benefits in your garden or for your fish. Oh, you know, so that's that's a that's a wonky calculation, but I'm glad I'm glad you shared it. Well, not, yeah. not only that, look at the carbon you've offset by not driving back and forth to the store for the feed. Yeah. <laughs> There's some hippy dippy shit for you right there. Uh, Steve, I wish more people cared about that. <laughs> We all care about it. We don't talk about it enough, but it's funny because you're amongst a bunch of hippies. So you keep bringing up hippies, and you're sitting in a pile of them. So. <laughs> oh no, my hair is just on the inside. That's all. Yeah. Just see. Just, <laughs> here you go. He's got spiritual dreads. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I got. I don't cut my hair. <laughs> Roger's no. looking like Fabio there now. Hey man, I, I have to admit, um, look at that. Sixty years old. Sixty years old. Still riding. Just start riding the front on the roller coaster. You'll be fine. I have yeah. to admit, uh, Steve. I don't think I recall seeing somebody with gray dreads, but I'm sure they're out there. Oh yeah, yeah. The old Rastas. Oh yeah. I think I got gray dreads. But yeah, yeah not too often. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's funny. any uh, any other. Um, Topics you wanted to touch on? Um, you're uh, you're always such a wealth of knowledge on the black soldier flies and stuff like that, and uh, I really appreciate uh, having you on. Um, I will say this: um, the the tiny pods that allow you know one or two years practice are kind of um, turnkey. They come with everything you need except the food waste and grubs to get started. Um, you can order popworms. <laughs> Popworms uh, from Texas A&M online, they'll send you thousands upon thousands of neonates and get you up and running really quickly. It's amazing. Some people just want to convert uh, food waste into grub biomass quickly, and they just have the popworms coming once a month, kind of like a renewal thing, and that way they just get tons of grubs all the time, in addition to their own you know, breeding regimen. Um, I will say that the larger one is more is less turnkey and more do it yourself, which means you have to go out and get materials. You have to get a couple cinder blocks, you have to get some burlap, you're gonna to need to get some coir um, and coffee grounds and a few other things that don't come with it. What comes with it is just the unit itself. So I tell people, you know, go through the manual before you, you receive it and collect the things you need. Nothing's really that difficult to find. Um, but it's not, um, like the small one where it comes with everything. You got to go out and get it. Um, a lot of people do talk about the lid, Steve. There is no lid for the big unit. In fact, when we engineered it on the original prototypes, it actually suffocated the pods because the, uh, mm. the metabolic rate of the grubs is so high. They use oxygen so quickly that the lid designs we had were inadequate at bringing in oxygen. So I tell people just have a topper of burlap on it to cut down on the light intrusion, to cut down on evaporative loss, to help um, keep the food waste from getting crusty and also provide a lot of growing uh, um, egg laying opportunities for the female. So that burlap topper that's just, on top of the food waste inside the pod is really all you need for a lid. Um, if for some reason there is a critical issue with needing a lid, you can get a piece of you know, plywood, cut a larger diameter circle so no rainfall gets in. And by the way, you have to site these in areas that don't uh, allow rain or direct sunlight to get in because those two things are problematic. Uh, it'll say that in the manual, but a lid in the form of a, 
a circle that's a larger diameter than the top diameter elevated several inches off on some legs, that would be okay because the oxygen and the air getting in and the convection currents are not really being um, prohibited from entry. And uh, I've seen that work and I, I've seen it work in a, in a way that didn't result in collapse. But that, a lot of people ask me that question, why is there no lids? That's probably the main reason. But there were other reasons too is, in fact, for a roto molding standpoint, because these are roto molded, it almost costs as much to make the lid as it would the body. And nobody wants to pay as much for the lid as they would a body. So there's also financial barriers. Right. So uh, I have a question. So do you do see? Oh, go ahead. Uh, you were mentioning freezing the grubs. Do they have a natural yearly life cycle? Or if you were keeping the temperatures right and whatever, can you have like a perpetual harvest with this setup like you can have with the worms? Got to be up. Um, in order to have a perpetual cycle going year round, you have to have a, a climate controlled condition. You couldn't do it outside, obviously. That being said, yes. The only things you'd have to remember is you have to divert a portion of your crawl off, maybe upwards of 3% into an area that allows them to hatch out. So have everyone seen those aluminum trays that you'd use for cooking things around the holidays? They're maybe about an inch and a half, two inches tall, and they're maybe the size of a sheet of paper. They're aluminum and you cook like, you know, something in them in the oven. You can put a little moist soil in there and throw the grubs in there and let them hatch out in one to two weeks. That gets you the adults flying around your greenhouse or insectarium, wherever you have these. And um, that is probably the best way to ensure continual uh, cycling of the species. I will say this, in the winter, when you do these seasonally, you're going to dump the whole pod and you're going to take out all the buildup of undigested residue. If you're doing it continually, that undigested residue doesn't ever really get dumped because you're always running it. So you're going to have to go in and remove that every six months or so because it'll build up too much volume or you know however long it takes to build up to the point where it's kind of inhibiting the pod so those are some just some things i always tell people who do these year round places in the tropics like puerto rico and hawaii and the islands who buy these and they do them year round they just have to make sure to pull out some of that undigested residue and you probably will have to change your drainage pad every couple of years because it does break down. Um, so uh, for those people, do you want to explain how the, you know, what the adults eat and drink or don't eat and drink or what it is? The it adults do? don't do much. I think they drink some, maybe some water, maybe some sugar water out of flowers. But as far as I'm aware, they no longer have a digestive tract. So they may basically just drink water to prevent de you know, dehydration and death. But there's no food consumption with the adults. Their lives, I mean, they only live about a week. So there's really no need to feed. Um, it's also why they're not associated with pestilence like houseflies. Houseflies do feed as adults and they can live for months. And they have to if they're going to live for months. So that's why they're always annoying you at like picnics and in your house and trying to land on food because they eat. Um, black soldier fly don't. That's another reason why they're not landing it on your food and picnics and stuff. They're just out in the foliage mating. They're really just, as an adult, just a breeding mechanism. Sounds like if they land on your food, you don't want to eat that food though. Black soldier fly, you know, I've never seen it happen. Um, Does it be putrid food? <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's assuming they were in some putrid food uh, first. But I, I don't know. I, I, again, I, I can't verify that because I have never read anything along those lines. But I guess anything's possible. You know, if you have enough land on your back, you technically could get lighter in weight. You know, if they start lifting you off the ground. But again, I've never... Been, that's never been verified. So anything's possible. Um, what was the other question? Oh, uh, so I, if somebody had an open container in a, in a greenhouse type thing, um, say a commercial aquaponics system or something like that, would you have to worry about the adults laying eggs in the grow beds or in other areas of the? I have not had reports of that. I have not had reports of that being a problem. 
Some people like to contain them in an insectarium area, which is just like some PVC with mosquito netting and all the adults are in there. Or other people just let them fly free. I guess I have not heard reports on the ones that fly free being a nuisance. I was just going to ask if they, if they end up in the lights. Because I know we've had a uh, oh, Ganja yeah. guy had a collection of... Um, right. Uh, ladybugs and it damn near caught fire in one of his lights. Uh, they are attracted to lights, and that's a possibility. Um, I know people who have greenhouses tend to have screened lights, and then that becomes irrelevant. I'd say lights that are exposed are probably not recommended. You probably have to screen them because that could happen, uh, Steve. Fish conjure guys actually problem was they were being sucked into the exhaust of the lights. They weren't actually going into the light. Well, they was our LEDs, so I don't think they would hurt them, but they were actually being sucked into the exhaust system of the light frame, you know, the light yeah. housing. And that's where they got trapped up. But I got a question because this is so what key and I, I I I'm keep saying I'm sitting here trying to figure it out. What am I missing here? What what keeps them from uh, black soldier flies from just flying away? Nothing. Well, I mean, if your greenhouse well, I mean, is contained, how yeah. are you raising them? I mean, why, why would you buy them and use them? If they, I mean, I, I'm trying to. If you well, no, that's I a good question. If your greenhouse is self-contained, obviously they're gonna they're not gonna get out. They're gonna stay in there and they're gonna breathe. In nature, like for example, here I'm in North Carolina. I don't bother even addressing the adult portion of the life cycle because they're all there. They're out there in nature and they just are going to come in and lay eggs. So I never worry about that. However, I do do one thing different than a lot of people. I just, occasionally, I'll take a handful. Um, is that Tommy or Roger? Roger? Roger. It was Roger, right? Yeah. Um, I take a handful of my crawl off and I whip it into the shrubs where I know the chickens can't access. And what that's doing is that's repopulating the adult portion of the native um, there's a, there's an inherent, You're just natural level. yeah, there's You're a natural level of the population in my area. I'm enhancing it. Okay. I got you. You're attracting flies. I'm, well, I'm, I'm trying Lord to, Lord of the flies. I'm trying to <laughs> increase, I'm trying to increase the number of adults that are naturally present in my area by, you. by seeding the natural area with more grubs. And so. If something escapes, I like it because I know they're just going to be adults to find the pods. Um, they don't tend to fly far, Roger, so they tend to stay local. But I've, I've never had a problem um, with them flying back in as long as it's the time of year where there's actually flying insects. Once it gets cold, you don't see that anymore. Oh yeah, that was that was some of the answer to my question because I know I'm having a I've got a commercial hydroponic greenhouse and I had I've tried uh, 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 beneficial insects and all and the bottom line is if there's no food for them to eat they go away, you know and uh, so it's it was kind of one of those things when I keep I've seen some videos where a guy did keep where he used the black soldier flies and he, he had, somehow he contained them and i can't remember how i it's been a while because i haven't really got into the the compost because it was in a compost situation you mean he, he contained the adults right yeah i guess that's yeah and he calls and he put stuff in there where they'd lay eggs on just yeah you put in the I bin mean, uh, uh roger i have seen so much over engineering on that component of the life cycle <laughs> which is i call the insectarium component yeah. which is what nature should be doing, which is allowing them to just live up in the canopy, reproduce, and then come back and fly in and lay eggs. That component I have seen be overly engineered with just these contraptions. I never do it because I do this seasonally. But if you're in an area that doesn't have the species, you're going to have to come up with a contraption if you don't have uh, a greenhouse. So Right. And so now, now uh, you, so you're in Carolina. I'm in Carolina. I'm in, I'm in, uh, I live in the hell hole swamp. Where, um, where do you live? What part? In the hell hole swamp. Okay. The Francis Marion National Forest. Awesome. Um, anyway, so you in the country, are you out there? Cause you sound like you're going on set. You talk about off the grid and stuff. So I didn't really catch her. I'm about an hour Northeast of Raleigh. Of Raleigh. Oh, okay. Up there. All right. Uh, Northeast the Lewisburg, of Lewisburg area outside of Lewisburg. Oh, okay. I mean, is that so? You have your a, a local business there too. It, there's nothingness there. 
Nothingness. <laughs> okay. Nothing. No, almost all the businesses online, my factory uh, that we contract with is in Smithfield, which you probably heard. Okay. That's where Andy Griffith, you know, and Opie lived for you guys at Gomer, you know. Oh, I thought that was Mount Airy. Well, they were, you know, Raleigh, they always were going to Raleigh, but yeah, Mount Airy, I mean, they were close, you know, it's up in that area, you know. Ah. Opie Land, sorry, I had, uh, yeah, you're right, Mount Airy. Opie Land. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that's nice. Uh, that's nice. I, you know, I'm kind of out there, you know, I'm kind of out there. It's a, so I've got a lot of, um, it's nice because this kind of thing makes me think too, because well, I've been thinking about the roaches and all with ever since I learned the Vaseline trick. You know, it's like Steve was talking about it, you know, like, yeah, just I had an aquarium with the roaches, like a million roaches in my kitchen right next to where I cook my food. And I put some Vaseline and they never, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, that's, you know, that's funny. But we cook good food uh, or especially when I'm drying OSHA root, man, we would dry <laughs> fresh OSHA root when we go harvest it from the forest and we'd have it drying. Man, they'd be like all of them up against the bottom of the the Vaseline, trying to find a way to get to it. it oh, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> we need a video. I told you we could make a horror movie out of that. If stuff. you ever, if you ever break your container, chocolate and OSHA root, they cannot resist those two things, and you can put that out, and you'll draw them all right back. And the chocolate's not toxic. No. Nope doesn't seem to have any issue um i've used cho chocolate always in my sticky traps when i was trying to bait in pet stores and stuff always work great you get mice you get roaches you get ants you get whatever it is that's there they, they seek out that that smell so I, have, I have some orga organic um kisses like little the things you put in cookies i can throw those in the the with the roaches yeah yeah i mean the you don't want to give them candy all the time but you can you know mix it in yeah yeah just during the holidays yeah i mean i wouldn't give it as their staple diet but if you're trying to if you you know are missing a couple or you dropped a container or something you need to draw the little ones out um you can get them to to go where you want them to that way steve can you give the top five recommended foods for hissers oh sure i would say um lettuce uh I would say go to your grocery store and just get ask them whatever they're about to throw out. You can get their yeah. vegetables, the potatoes, lettuces, any kind of greens. Um, uh, they re, uh, if you're going to gut load them, uh, another one is uh, uh, pineapples, grapes, pears, plums, uh, apples. You can give them all the rotten stuff off the tree, stuff that's got worms and stuff in it. Just throw it in there. They'll, they'll eat all of it. They'll even eat the worms. Um, the fishers will eat all those fruits. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, basically anything that's not meat, you know, you give them to your BSFs. Oh, because they're vegetarians, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they'll eat a little bit of meat, but not much. In Jamaica, we use a, a species called a mango roach, which is real similar to a hisser. They they look very de um, um, <laughs> almost identical, but they're orange. They're huge. They're about this. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, for real, they're good. You know. <laughs> no, but they're, they're, I would say they're they're about, you know, maybe this much on my phone. They're almost as big as a hisser. They're big and they're slow. They don't fly. Um, they're pretty slow. Um, and we, we just keep them in the same thing. We have um, uh, down there because we raised so many of them. We just have a sawed off IBC tote that has, you know, four or five inches of, of Vaseline across the top. And then um, we've got drain holes and then there's a little thatched roof above it to keep the rain out and keep the sun off of it. Just like you were talking about. And then they had to put screening on it because the local birds, they have these black birds in Jamaica that they call them like mob birds or whatever. And they'll come right into your house and start eating all the stuff off your counter uh, or, you know, get into your cabinets and stuff. They're, they're jerks. Um, but they'll come in and, and clean out all your, all your roaches if you don't, uh, if you're not careful. Cool. <laughs> but uh, that and we, we do spirulina. So between the roaches and the spirulina um, gives a pretty good, uh, base from you know most of your your feed for the fish just dry out the spirulina and we press it into a flake uh kind of like these thin wafers and we feed that to the, the tilapia you know if you'd have told me 10 years ago i was going to be enthralled by being part of a panel talking about bugs all night yeah, <laughs> never really, yeah. <laughs> do we lose carl what has our life come to yeah it looks like we lost carl for a minute 
Looks like, yeah, Carl's. I knew he didn't drop out because he was having fun. If he wouldn't have left it out. Well, I see his, his logo. Looks like he got disconnected. <laughs> I just see a black space on him. He probably yeah, on the uh, on the the live feed or the user feed that just a just his logo. Hopefully he'll come back in a second. Got any more chat questions? Anybody active in chat? Uh, David David was wondering. You know he was he was. Uh, I think is he in chat tonight? Yeah, he was in chat earlier. He's got a lot Sorry. going on over there. No worries. Oh, who's going on? Uh, somebody just popped in. Roots 604. 6 so. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Carl. It was such a cool talk, and it's so much cool uh, information on uh, all the oh, different uh, insects and everything. It was really awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, keep me posted on things that... Uh, 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 sort of evolve from this conversation because sure. you know their technology evolves drastically uh, when it comes to this particular industry and I think uh, there's going to be get to the point where I think a lot more people are going to start cultivating uh, insects because they want to eat lower on the food chain they want to be more self-reliant or maybe you know for some other reasons but I think we're going to see more, a lot more of this, uh, and it would it's going to be less marginal, in my personal opinion. I, I know um, back when I worked with the aquaponics source, we sold a lot of your bins to people that were doing prepping. Um, you know, people that wanted to, you know, have a backup food supply or a backup supply for their, feed, you know, their, their livestock and stuff like that. You yeah, know, I would say there's a lot of people in that. I, I call them the survivalists or self-reliant uh, category that purchase our technologies. A lot of permaculture people do, and a lot of uh, uh, homesteaders do. It's interesting when I have actual events and I speak to a group, and there's like survivalists in all their camo with their guns, and then all these hippies with like um, their smudge sticks and and you know vegetarian lunches that they brought all in one room together. It's so interesting watching them interact because you know. By attending, they have to just get along with each other, and it's really – that's the best part of these conferences is watching yeah. the dynamics of the two diametrically opposed groups yeah. interact. It's it's That's worth it, just seeing that. Bugs bring people together. Oh, they do. <laughs> well, I mean, they both have an interest in self-reliance. They're just, reliance. They're just coming at it from two different approaches. Well, and it's the truth. If you, you know, you're, if you're going to sustain yourself in, in, you know, time of survival, you need it all. You need bugs. You need all kinds of different things. You need to, you know, but I don't really prepare, but I've been learning things for, you know, for 12 well, Roger, years. I've been studying, doing all this stuff, trying to make sure I'll be okay. I think you hit it on the head, Roger. You actually need all of this when you said that. I think the hippies forget that they need the security component of transitioning and prepping and homesteading and the security people also need the people who are going to be producing food and manage the animals. So you actually, you need both um, thought processes together working as a team in order to have long-term survival. You can't do one without the other. You really need both. Right. You need to, you need to find them right now. You, you're, if you're smart and you got that, you're like-minded, you need to find a piece of land with a good wealth. We need some militant hippies. Yeah, you have a good well, though. I have a, you know, I have a good well, and it's going to be a good well no matter whether the lights are on or not. You know, so. Well, um, Roger, I take that one step further. I put a backup well, and I dig several surface ponds just to engage. <laughs> well, we could do that. Our aquifer is pretty, pretty plentiful here. We can, we can do that. We're in the swamp, so, you know, we can find water pretty quick. Yeah, it, yeah. North Carolina, we're lucky. There's a lot of surface water. Yeah, you got, but you also got a lot of highland. You got mountains and stuff that we don't really. I mean, we got a little bit, but mostly you got rolling hills here in Carolina. Low, well, South Carolina. I mean, you know, I guess we could argue which is Carolina. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. Of course. 
No, I, I think that was a, a really good point. I know when I was at Occupy, yeah, it was funny to see the super far left and then also like a lot of teabaggers and, and a lot of right-wing people that were there of both opposing the the bank buyout stuff. And, and uh, it was really cool to see people that normally wouldn't even speak to each other marching with each other and totally on the same page. And it's, it's, it is, uh, especially, you know, when we used to teach the, uh, um, uh, off grid class at, at, at uh, aquaponics source. It was always funny to see that dynamic between like the, the little intentional community people. And then you got like the hard, super hardcore preppers and it was just really funny. And then I know uh, Sylvia ad advertised for a little bit on the Alex Jones show. And then we were getting the really, really interesting customers. Wow. <laughs> Cause yeah, there's a huge demographic for, for people that want to be self sustainable and, and do the prep stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Or at least, if not that, they're just running, wanting to be more organic and natural now and self-sustaining, instead of and knowing where their the food they're they're eating comes from. And, and that, that was that was before Alex Jones went in uh, full crazy. That was back when he was just like the weird prepper guy that was selling uh, food packs. What and, back when Alex Jones was twelve? <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's definitely a colorful personality. I will yeah, say that. <laughs> Food so I'm not sure what yeah. color it is. <laughs> right. Well, uh, so do you do you have a, any garden of your own at all or anything? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. I probably have about a dozen raised beds, most of which are about twelve by four feet. I, I found that that's the most manageable, and I have just about every annual. Um, every year, I expand the garden, make it bigger. Right now, I just planted, you know, the winter, uh, not the winter, the fall crops. So I just put in things from arugula, all the greens, turnips, uh, snap peas. I do snap peas, which are the uh, peas that you can eat the pods. I found it actually easier than purchase, uh, growing the shelling peas, which just take up way too much time. If you can eat all of it, it's just faster. Yeah. It. It's fucking, oh, I'm sorry, it tastes great, too. Yeah, they're sweet. We love um, snap peas down here. They used to eat them like candy. Oh, and yeah. I put in, because, you know, Carolina is such a long season, Steve. I put in um, squash, too, like the zucchini and yellow crookneck, uh, because it's only going to take 50, 55 days. I planted yeah. it just a few weeks ago, and I already got harvest. I put in some potatoes for the fall crop, because you don't want to do that in the summer. It's too hot here. Um what what else, uh, Roger? Can we grow now? Radishes and oh, all the brassicas. You broccoli, you could do broccoli. All the brassicas, the whole broccoli. I mean, if you want a long time growing, I mean, I, I've never really got into it, but bro I'm kind of in broccoli, um, asparagus. You know, you could do that cabbage. It's time to plant cabbage again because that'll be. Yeah, asparagus is a spring spring crop here though, and it's a perennial, so it's a little bit different. You have to have a permanent bed for asparagus, but they do pump out for about thirty years. And that's the thing too. I guess it's about you got to start it up and keep it going and going and going. You do. So really, you can start it again. There's two seasons, you know, over here. We got two seasons. We got your spring season that is basically in June. All the tomato sheds and everything down here are closed in June. The tomato growing's done outside. But I start my seeds in June for the greenhouse, and then by September, I've got yield. I'm yielding fruit. September, October, the greenhouses open up, and they yield fruit to the end of December. Which, since I had an unheated greenhouse, that's the end of my growing season. With a heated greenhouse, I've got friends that I sell all the way from when they, in fact, their year starts in, in July when they do their seeds. They start, they get everything out there, and they redo their houses, and they all grow in uh, Beto buckets. And uh, I'm the only one, that, I grow in three to five gallon uh, poly bags with perlite. They grow with beto buckets perlite. I spray to waste, they drip to waste, but they have heat. So they start their seeds in June or July every year. And then they start, they open up their uh, markets, uh, their, you know, their, their greenhouse market at their land, uh, like in September, October. And they're able to grow all the way until June. And they do so they so we grow in a greenhouse all the way from you know like from July where you start it because propagation can be hot as hell 
when you're first starting. So hot and humid is good for propagation. And then by the time it cools down in September, like right now, everything's fixed. All the tomato growers and uh, greenhouses here are going, going to go nuts because it's been 80-something in the daytime and 70-something at night. And them tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers love that. And so if you got heat, you could grow all the way till June of next year. And then you shut down, tear everything down, clean it up, and go again. So that's what the advantage of having a greenhouse and living in the right place. And we do. You're right. Now, the thing you used to have a crook day squash, and all I can think about is bugs. <laughs> yeah, how about harvesting some of them bugs? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do to keep all the bugs from spreading to your other crops, Carl, when you're growing the crook neck squash, which brings more bugs than any crop on the planet, probably? Um, to tell you the truth, I have mesh cages over all my squash because of the squash borer. Yep. Okay. The mesh, the mesh does allow the pollinator to come in, but if you notice the squash borer, which is a moth, they can't get through the mesh, uh, but the pollinators can. And uh, I've noticed that. I got about 90% reduction on squash borer uh, infestation, but it's such a ni nightmare pest here that I've really been relegated to just grow, um, uh, what's the one squash that's immune? Um, I'm butternut. not sure. Butternut. Yeah, I'd like to find out what's immune that doesn't get it. But butternut. So Butternut's immune to the squash borer. Oh, they can't the break the, the okay. thick stem. Yeah, well that, oh yeah, we love that old that's old northern squash kind of thing. Um, well, yeah, we, it's like a winter squash, but um, all the other squashes, like the summer squashes, they get decimated by the squash borer. So you talk about screen. Is that like quarter inch openings? Like that? Mesh? Um, I'll quarter measure inch? it and let you know. I actually don't. Oh, know. Okay. I'd say it's close to quarter inch. Yeah, well, that's close enough. I mean, you know, that's good. It's gonna be what's available to somebody to find locally, and we're just talking about some, you know, helping somebody out. And actually, it's pretty nice we're talking about some veggies, you know, uh, tonight. So I appreciate that. No, but I, I just had to, because I swear when you mentioned how you're growing all that stuff out there, and I go, we're talking about bugs, and then you brought up squash. You know? Oh, I mean, honestly, I don't use chemicals. So, so Roger, when it comes time to deal with, uh, like, the potato beetle, I just go one afternoon for an hour and just manually squish them all. And then I do it a couple days later, and that's good enough control. Wow. For potatoes. Well, you don't even use a soap or anything either, huh? No, I don't. Um, the one other thing I didn't plant that I still will uh, this weekend, Roger, is uh, scallions. I'll put a bed of scallions in. Oh, yeah. Those are nice. They're so quick. Well, awesome. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, that was a really awesome uh, uh, talk you gave. That was really, really cool. Thanks so much. All right, guys. I'm going to tell people how to find you. Answering my silly questions. Yeah, Tar River Trading Post. Find us on Facebook. It's always the easiest for communication. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. And you're welcome to stick around if you want. We're about another half hour. We kind of just go over what everyone's doing in their garden and stuff. So you're welcome to stay and join us. If not, it's as late on the East Coast. So if you want to bow out, that's totally cool too. Um, I w would like to know from Roger um, – what particular crops he thinks are the best to grow here in the Carolinas in regards to production? Uh, oh. What would he well, say the best best are? Are you now? You when you say production of what will grow the best, or what you're going to um, make the, 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 the littlest amount of problems versus the amount you receive back in a harvest? Like I personally found out that peppers, personally, sweet potato and blueberries seem to be the easiest here. Okay, well, I'm my my company. Uh, I I I I won't tell you online because that'll pinpoint me. But my farm is my hydro. I've got a hydroponic greenhouse farm. It's a uh, pepper farm. Ah. But I grow cucumbers. Uh, thing is to get the margin up on the on the resale to the. To the I grow for Whole Foods. So um, I. I <sighs> Yeah, and I don't make any money, so I've kind of gotten away, kind of gotten away from all that. I've gone back to the table stuff, to which I, I, I try to grow stuff that. Are you there? You look like you froze. Oh, okay, I, I try to grow stuff that I can eat and I can sell sell to people in open air market now because I'm a small farm. So I found that I couldn't really. I put a lot of money into getting prepped and getting everything done to grow a bunch of pepper plants 
and I got beautiful preppers and Whole Foods loves my produce, but I can never make any money at the end of the year. So I decided that I'd make a lot more money if I, or like, I, like I, well, I'd enhance my income or at least, you know, make some profit by growing the, 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 the lettuce, lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and, and pepper still. So basically that, anything on the vine, um, I can grow any kind of microgreens. Uh, you could, in fact, there's, there's a lot of, uh, we're in, a, I'm in an area where uh, uh, we have a, the certified South Carolina or certified, you know, you got that North Carolina too. I don't know if you're involved or know anything about that, but we have certified South Carolina grown and we have fresh to the table and fresh to the table is where restaurants in the Carolinas and Georgia and all, because when we have a USD thing or something at Clemson, people are from North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina are all there. We got yeah. people from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, people from South Carolina, Georgia, and then we got representatives of USDA. And um, <laughs> I got ahead of myself, <laughs> but uh, I, I found that the, the, it's best to grow the. Well, all right, let me get back on my train of thought. All right. All right. With the fresh to the table, you can if you can if you're willing to do a lot of, of, of legwork and all, you can get in touch. Which I did try to do well, but I'm blind and I no longer can drive, so it's really put a hindrance on anything I do. So I've totally gone to where I'll be going to be doing open air market, local market stuff now, and I'm not doing Whole Foods anymore because I can't get it there because I have to drive it over an hour to to deliver it, so it can be delivered to the southeast region. And, but people that want to start can do microgreens. There's a big market for microgreens and, and you can get in touch with the uh, fresh to the table is for you to get in contact with all the restaurants in the, in your area. And it, that's, this is a, something that's in North Carolina too, where people you, so that's what we were trying to do. Uh, microgreens, anything that if you can get a chef, we do CSA, Community Sponsored Agriculture, where we sell a big chunk of money. You, you, you give us some, some money, we guarantee you X amount of pounds of fresh produce throughout the season. You know, uh, but I think you're right on the right on there. Um, I've done I've done some potatoes, but I don't seem to get the yellow potatoes because I honestly don't think we got a long enough cold period. Like you were just saying, like with uh, you were just talking a minute ago. Um, I, I lettuce grow, you grow lettuce like crazy around here. So you can have a lettuce crop, you know, you can, and you, the problem is we had a lot of that years ago and that scare happened in California where the, the cattle had gotten into the water supply and they had that salmonella break probably 10, eight, eight years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. And, and nobody would buy, I had a friend that had a 40, a 30 by 144 foot greenhouse with a pond where he had an automated system growing um, uh, romaine lettuce, the most awesome romaine lettuce you've read in life. Like this, I mean, a foot and a half to two feet tall at the end. And, and he had to just shit can it all and kill it because when that salmonella scare, salmonella scare came out, nobody would, no markets, nobody would buy lettuce. People were that ignorant. So it's such a fragile situation. As far as growing stuff that is, you can grow, I'd stay with the viney plants, the cucumbers, tomatoes, and the peppers, because those are the ones that cost you the most money. Lettuce is easy to grow, so grow whatever you need to put in your salad. And then whatever herbs you want are real easy to grow. And in it just like here, we've got a longer grow season than you do. Um, probably a month, maybe. Um, or so, I don't know, maybe on each end. But are you zone eight and a half probably? I think we're more like seven and seven to seven and a half to eight. I, I'm seven B here, but with climate change, we're more like eight. Um, well, see, I'm south of you, so I'm gonna go down to seven because the lower, like seven's warmer and six is warmer, right? No, it's the oh, other I way. Guess, so I, you're, you're probably I'm eight and a half. Nine. Nine. Yeah, you're probably eight and a half. Can you, can you grow uh, low quats there? I've never tried. I I had no vested interest. Uh, do you have citrus there? You can grow lemons and limes here pretty good, but oranges are better in Florida and southern Georgia. Yeah, um, you're probably eight and a half, nine then. Um, I was yeah, just yeah, lemons and limes grow great here. Uh, you know, we've uh, 
not much apples, not much on the apple side here at all. Yeah, they need cool climate. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying to think what else I see around. Uh, oh, you well, probably can do figs really well. Peaches and and um, pears. Pears do pretty well here. Peaches do well. Lemons and limes. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm you sure you can grow, grow an orange easily. You could probably grow an orange tree if you've got an orange tree in a place, you know, like a nice part of your yard. It, you know, it would just take a while and it'd just be for you. You wouldn't be able to make a, a, a cash crop out of it. But you could. I, I've noticed my pear trees do better than apple trees in North Carolina. Um, yeah. My fig trees do really well here. Um, and I probably should put more fig trees in, but I'm probably going to pull back on my apples. It's just. They're really, it's almost too hot here. You need up north. You know, you yeah. Need to be up north about Same with things like cherries. Cherries just don't do well here unless, it, unless it's the sour cherry. Now, see, I got cherries in my yard, but they're not really producing anything. But I'll tell you another, muscadine is what people grow. And, and if I can take a segue, we always talk about ferments. And one night we were talking about ferments and stuff. And I couldn't think of what it was, but what grows practically wild around here. And everybody has, and it's real cheap. And we're talking about doing ferments for the fish. Muscadine. Yeah, Great. here too. Here too. Yeah, they, make, they make a wine out of it. You can't eat them, man. That's some, I, I, well, I can't eat them. You know, that, that's some nasty you know, sour. I don't mind them. I actually like the flavor. Um, <laughs> I have the golden one on my property. I don't have the I don't have the blue one, you know, the blue purple. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean I won't get the other one. I uh how many acres do you have, Roger, approximately? I just got a couple because uh, I was I, – I, well, we I started the greenhouse operation after we had our land and we had two acres. And then I said, well, that's big enough to do something. And, and I, I got there, you know. And now I, just, I have a 100-foot hoop house. I just put new plastic on it that's totally underutilized. So I'm going to try to do some stuff with it this year. Um, I'm up to about – I have 68 acres now. And um, I'm adjacent to a large vineyard. And so – Wow. Like, why should I grow grapes when they have a whole 300 acres of grapes? Right. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to do conventional, hydroponic, aquaponics? What, are you an aquaponic guy at all? Because, you know, I just wonder, because most guys that come on the show are somewhat, or they thought about it. Or you do no, I, I, I look at aquaponics as a city um, <laughs> pursuit. If you have very limited space and you have like a, like a, a warehouse or an old factory that, you could reutilize or repurpose. I think aquaponics works great, but in the country when there's two or three thousand dollars an acre, you know, just grow stuff in the fucking ground. In the sun. Well, I agree. Yeah, like, yeah. I agree, but I disagree. You could do hydroponics and grow. You get three times faster, a lot more yield, and all kinds of stuff doing a simple hydroponics drip system. Yeah. In your hood in your hoop house? Well, I think for things like like things like corn or sunflowers. That's, oh know. no! Yeah. Well, fertigation. I don't know. They're, they're doing a lot of work where they're doing the fertigation, which is drip tape buried along the root zone. Yeah, they, they I've just, heard about they, that. They that every day, and the guy, everybody that's growing strawberries professionally, commercially in the Carolinas, are using that same thing. In fact. Now, I wouldn't. I have my own mix that I've had made for years, but I've got friends that have 250 rows, 100 feet long of, 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 of uh, uh, strawberries that are out of this freaking world. And they bring in a 400-gallon tank of concentrate from Clemson every year, bury it in the ground next to their all their stuff was buried, and then they run it all year. Now, I'm not a big uh, – I'm running all that chemical – you know the way i mean again i eat the, i'll eat the strawberries though so i'm not sure i wouldn't you know but I, I i make my own solution so i don't have any need for that but all i'm saying is uh i think you'd find that in your hoop house if you were willing to try some fertigation like i was talking about or some aqua uh, some hydroponics you might enjoy the better yield and really tasty fruit too, real juicy, tasty fruit. I have honestly, Roger. I have not used the fertigation tape. What? It, where do you get it? Do you just dripworks.com or FarmTech? Um, you can buy it pretty much. Well, FarmTech, FarmTech. There you go. That you can get it from Ag. Well, you're in Carolinas. Just get it from Southern Ag. Okay. Call up Southern Ag. You know what I'm talking about, right? No, maybe. Yeah. Well, they're in North Carolina and Georgia. And they yeah. drive trucks. They drive. They'll drive a truck to your house and drop it off for twenty bucks. Okay. 
I mean, well, I mean, you can order whatever you want because once you hook up an account with them, you could order anything you want from now on and get a much cheaper price, plastic or anything else you want. Just go to Southern Egg. You'll make an account. And they have a truck that drives around North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia every Wednesday and Thursday. And, and if you make an order, they drop it off Wednesday or Thursday on your driveway. Do you have a recommendation on a cultivar you recommend for strawberries? No, but I can find out for you. We can keep in touch. I'll find out for you. Because yeah. the cultivars that are in the north are not the ones that do well here. No, because you've got a longer – oh, go ahead, Steve. I was going to say that uh, the little sweet – I've been doing a lot of wild raspberries or cultivated wild raspberries that I have, especially in Colorado. I had a couple of different strains we found in the mountains that were really good <laughs> and brought them down and then just transferred them into the greenhouse. Awesome. Um, I have not had the best of luck with some cultivars of strawberries, but then again, I don't let those reproduce. I let the ones that do reproduce. The ones that tend to be really large and do well in the South tend to be plagued with a lot of fungal issues. So there really isn't the perfect one that I found. So that's why I asked about the cultivar. And, that and spider mites. If you buy a store bought, Spider, or uh, I'm sorry. If you buy store bought spider mites, plant, there's a high chance that you'll have a strawberry plant, plant attached to them. Yep. So if you buy a spider mite colony at the store, so buy, so buy, so start your strawberries on your own. Yeah, or just make sure you just bomb the ever loving shit out of them with something like a, a lemongrass oil based uh, pesticide or something like that is really good for nuking them. Without you know, you can still eat the fruit on it and everything. Um, just try not to hit the flowers if you can help it, but. Making right. sure that when you get your, your root starts, <laughs> anything that's sold in a store uh, pretty much will have the um, spider mites on them. It's just, it's a plague. Does that, CO2, does that CO2 kill work on that stuff too, Steve? That you oh, yeah, yeah. Using? Absolutely. So you can take your your starts, throw them in a, a commercial trash bag, throw a pitcher in there with some dry ice in it, Fill it up, maybe uh, you know, get a little four-pound block or five-pound block. Throw it in a pitcher. Pour some hot water in there and quickly close up the bag and tie it off, um, just enough so that the air can seep out. But um, basically, to replace the air with CO2, uh, work like a little gas chamber, and you can kill all the mites and everything. It won't kill eggs, but it will kill all the adults. How long? Oh, uh, you do it in there for 35 to 40 minutes, and then open the bag up. Good question. <laughs> but it's it's super super cheap, uh, and it you know. Uh, and safe and, and everything else. So, and I assume DE works good with spider mites. Yes. Yeah. So I was just going to say that myself. You could actually, you could actually take that and and put and put them down and and dust the dust the medium with uh, DE, and that would do the same thing. That would kill them, and it would kill the eggs when they hatch too, or the hatchlings, or whatever you want to call them. I mean, I wouldn't believe it if I if I hadn't seen it. I hadn't been living years mite free for years now. After using DE, I would never even bring it up. But boy, it's nice to see you guys on the show bring it up too, so that it shows that I'm not the only person on the planet talking about it. Did we lose you, Steve, or did you move no. you? I'm just okay. muted. I just had a had to deal with something off the computer. No worries. But I but I've got a, a local farm that's real successful with strawberries, Carl. I'll look. I'll, I'll try to find out what they're growing. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll call the county agent tomorrow. Um, I'll call the county agent and find out what strawberries do the best in this region. You know. And I, I, have you tried that? Um, I yeah. found my between you and me. I found my cooperative extension office to be closer to useless than if I was to go ask um, one of the employees at the Walmart Garden Center. Well, they, uh, that's and that's sad. We, well, we go back and forth with that. Well, I've had some really good help, and and I love Clemson and all, and and they're tr they're moving forward. But I did find out when I first started in our hydroponics down and growing down here that they didn't really. I couldn't find anybody. Now, I don't want to make a broad statement that nobody at Clemson in agriculture or anywhere in the agriculture department had did not have a clue about hydroponics, but. It appeared that they didn't really have a clue about hydroponics, and I get the same thing from all the other guys with hydroponic greenhouses in the area and the state. And it's kind of, but they—I want to say this—they are moving forward, and they've done 
a lot that really press that fertigation and that fertigation is working because instead of having to drag and do all that stuff and amend it and throw all this fertilizer all over the damn field and waste thousands of dollars now they're just applying nutrients to the root zone so i don't see you know i, I just it's just an awesome way it's bringing farmers uh it's making it cheaper for them to grow and uh it's it's making farms successful because it's not a matter of whether the roots went and found the nutrients or not, the minerals or fertilizer or not. It's applied, and then the plant uses what it wants. And if you know what you're doing, you give it what it wants, it'll be great. I, I'm very familiar with Clemson. They are, they are a top-notch extension state. North Carolina, NC State is top-notch. But remember, we have 100 counties here. I just happen to be in a county where most of the agricultural interest is commodity crops. And so they have no people that handle things like aquaponics or permaculture yeah. or home You're talking, about corn. You're talking so about corn and stuff, right? You go, you go to Asheville or you go to Pittsburgh or Orange County and you'll get those types of extension agents that really know about the things that we're interested in. But the extension people I encounter really don't overlap my interests. So. That's a great. That's a great uh, thing for you guys to bring up. Is that if you are having problems, especially with insects, and you don't know what they are in a, in an outdoor environment, yeah. man, the, your local agricultural extension, or you know, maybe not even the and like he's saying, maybe not even the one directly close to you, but maybe one not far away at a different school or a, a county or two over, are great ways to find out what the hell it is that's destroying your plants or attacking your system or causing you havoc oh, because that's what they deal with that's what their job is and they will take they, they're very friendly and will take if you call them up uh, you may not get them because they're always out in the field but they'll call you back i've never had a, an extension agent or a, a county agent like green acres is a place to be good you know and um i never had an extension agent not call me back and give me all the time i needed to talk about my problems and try to solve it for me. So I, I get that on the forum all the time that people, you know, they're going, well, what do I do? I said, well, I don't live in fricking wherever you're at, call your county agent. You know I mean? They're, they're, you know, if you've got a local agriculture or environmental issue or a bug issue or whatever, call your they're county also, agent. Also, you know? most of them, most of them smoke weeds. So you don't have to really worry if you tell them, oh yeah, well my weed plants, like yeah, well, even if you're in a less than legal area, 95% of the time, those guys smoke weed. So you don't I know. Would just, <laughs> I would just stick to saying, you know, I'm growing tomatoes and leave it at that. Tomatoes and peppers <laughs> and stuff. And and, and yeah, we're not quite there yet to tell people in no, Carolina I mean, to grow weed. Yeah, you know? but I mean, I mean, most places though, just saying like the likelihood of them being like a secret <laughs> DEA agent is pretty close to zero because most of them are working as an ag extension, you know, uh, to be out in the field and, and enjoying that kind of stuff anyway. So, well, the thing is, is they don't really people. care about a guy growing some weed to grow, smoke some weed in their house. Exactly. So the, county, the, the county sheriff, they don't care about a guy growing a few plants. If he's no. sitting in his house watching football and drinking beer and smoking some weed, but if he goes out there on the corner and starts selling pounds, they're going to jump, jump his ass. Yeah. They're more interested in meth labs and crack dealers and all that a out big there. Way. Yep. It's going up. Well, meth labs is a big thing because we've had meth three is, or four blown up here. Yep. You know, they, they, just blow, they blow that shit up. And, and uh, yeah, and so our county – uh, well, he, it's funny. Our county sheriff got kicked out because he got in trouble. But, and but open this, blasters. People open blasting. That's another one. Yeah. Well, and see, that's the other thing. That's why, you know, people say, well, you've never done this. Well, see, I stay away from the concentrates and stuff that, see, I can I can get away with having a little bit of weed, you know, and, and, and even if I get caught, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble, but not that much trouble. Yeah. But if I got if, – if, if I got – Freaking butane concentrate lab, yeah. They're gonna burn my ass and take my fucking land, and then I can't grow no tomatoes. So you know, yep. you know I, I err on the side of my tomatoes. So <laughs> my peppers. Oh, my farm's gonna curse me now. Curse my peppers. I err on the side of my peppers before I want to do concentrates. But uh, you can I do sure concentrate. They, there's people. There's a market for for pepper concentrates now. Actually, I don't know if you saw that really? online. Yeah. Well, Steve, hook me up, buddy, and I'll grow the shit out of some peppers around here. There you go. 
And then when they come around, they come around and you show them that, I'd be like, I don't think you want to smoke this, man. This is Carolina Reaper juice. <laughs> oh, Carolina Reaper. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> from the world. Steve, I've got, I've got, I've got yeah, somebody. Steve, you cannot imagine how easy it is to grow peppers in the Carolinas. <laughs> Well, in Jamaica, so we, there's a, a pepper tree uh, at the apartment I have in Jamaica, and the base on it, I no lie, is like a good foot and a half across, and it's a been tree. Alive. It's it's been the size of a small citrus tree, and it's yeah, it's been alive for like forty or fifty years, uh, and it's a um, uh, uh, what the hell are they called? Um, Scotch bonnet pepper pepper tree. Habanero. Uh, uh, Scotch bonnets, but. Yeah, well, Scotch bonnet is a habanero. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, so that uh, I mean, and that's literally a tree. So yeah, when you have them in good conditions and they can overwinter and maybe just defoliate, I mean, you get monstrous. Well, I mean, peppers are soft perennials; they're not annuals. We just treat them as annuals because of our climate. But yep. you can they can grow for years. I actually don't know what their lifespan is. I assume several years. Well, here's something interesting. Um, well, first of all, here's a here's a habanero. Yep. Hey, uh, I, I got a question for the guy in chat. Uh, Voji grows. He's saying he, he grows lots of peppers in South Florida. Do you grow um, uh, sweet sop, or I think they call it, was it nana in Spanish, or, or custard apple, I think they call it in, in English? Uh, I've never heard of those, but um, I, you know, I'm always and, interested in finding new peppers. I'm really, you know, really am. Well, this is, this is a fruit tree. I was just kind of curious. Where does it grow? Uh, uh, it's native to Jamaica and the Caribbean. Let me click on it here. Hold on. It's a, there's three in that family. You got sweet sop, sour sop. Sour sop is uh, uh what's the English name for sour sop? Uh, uh, damn it. Well, while you're thinking of it, let me answer the there thing is. about the peppers. When I first started growing, you know, hydroponics 12, 12 years or so ago, I actually experimented with some deep water culture. Uh, peppers and tomatoes and I had a, 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 I, I had a like an eight gallon sterilite tub from Walmart with some with like four net pots and three and three quarter net pots with a with a uh, and I had four different colored it was a mixed patch of uh, bell peppers different colors red purple uh, yellow and green uh, you know, red uh, you know, what orange orange and so I grew them and so I, I grew a little bit didn't have a lot of success because deep water culture here the water you can't keep it cool enough unless you do a cooling system so it doesn't really it's not a good idea well I'm not saying it's not a good idea because I really grew some nice plants but it's the the logistics of it it just doesn't make sense in the long run for me and I don't want that's another show um, but but the but the thing is is the winter came and I just, I was just, I was in one, you know, I've got a million things to do. And I left that damn bucket, that, that bubbler out there on the side of the, on the side of the place all winter long. And then I went out there one day in the spring and I had four or five peppers growing out of that sucker. Nice. And then I went through the, I just let it go. I got three years. I grew peppers before I finally just cleaned it up because there was really something I was keeping going with electricity that was producing just a few peppers. But the interesting thing, like, you were saying about that tree. If you take care of and keep the roots alive, I believe that you could grow a pepper plant that you could have pepper yield every year. I think it may decrease. I don't know if it decreased or not. Yeah, I've what never had do, more. What you can do is you can take them and put them in your garage and you defoliate them and it keep them warm enough that it keeps the root balls warm, but they'll, they'll go into like a hibernation. Really? <laughs> Yep. But, yeah. There's, but here, I, I've, so that's one of my secret passions. And if you guys are looking into like, want to get hardcore and and uh, pull from pull from a different pool of knowledge than all the cannabis stuff that's out there. Um, if you go on to like the hardcore pepper Facebook groups, you would not be able to tell a difference between them and the weed groups because these guys right. are doing LSTing, they're grafting, they're doing all all the same stuff that we're doing with cannabis, but with peppers and growing them indefinitely. So you have guys that have. Um, what, what's it called when they do, uh, 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 with the trees, topiary, you have guys doing topiary, um, peppers in their basement and the whole wall is, is peppers, like all kinds of crazy stuff with these guys yeah. or, or guys have them set up in ra like, like horizontal racks, like topiary apple trees and stuff like that. It's really cool. Some of the stuff these guys are doing. Well, I used to grow peppers and, 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 um, uh, and cannabis in the same room. And I would just keep the peppers on the outside, mm. uh, on the wall. 
you know, kind I of got thing you like one better. I got and you I one better. I actually, I grafted I a pepper. I grafted a pepper a pepper yeah, cutting uh, onto a onto a uh, cannabis plant. Hold on, I'll pull up a picture while, while we're talking. Oh my God, you grafted a can't you got you got it to take? Yeah. And grow? Cool, man. Like a zombie plant. <laughs> Tommy's seen the picture. Yeah, it's badass. I'm trying to find that. Give me, give me a minute or two. I'll, I'll dig up the picture. If not, I can pull it from one of my presentations. But uh, hey, I looked up soursop. It's also called guanabana. My mom has given me guanabana before because uh, she's mm -hmm. Latino, and the guanabana is uh, a nice beverage. But that is a soursop. Oh. Sweet sop, I wasn't familiar with, but yeah. you called it sugar apple. Yeah, yeah. I, I think They're tropical fruits. I don't think they would even grow in Rogers' climate. Yeah, definitely not Rogers, but I was just curious about the guy's studios in South Florida. South Florida, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you probably need where you don't have a winter at all, and that's, that would be yeah. down in Miami and Lauderdale and all that. Whereas the, the sour sop... Yeah. The sour sop, you can run them in, in colder weather. They, they, it's long, I think about forty degrees they'll they'll tolerate. Well, well, I only get that. I only get down to below forty about five nights a year, usually. You know, yeah, I, in we, a hoop house, you could probably get away with it. It'll be like, well, that's what happens to my peppers every year. Somehow, I don't ask me why. It doesn't matter if there's like you could play golf on Christmas Day on the 28th or 29th or 30th of freaking December every year. A cold snap happens that kills my tops. You know, and it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It could have been cold as shit all December, but they were still, but not cold enough. And then it's always right before January, right before New Year's. It always kills them. So that I can pretty much say that you can grow from April to first of the year where I am, where, where I'm at. And then it gets really cold in January, February, but not always below, not always below 40 degrees. You know, even at night, uh, in the daytime, we only have a couple of uh, a month. Well, if we have one of those what El Nino type situations, are we in an El Nino now? I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I can never keep up with it because it just seems like it's, uh, you know. But anyway, or <laughs> La Nina, whatever it is. Um, I I think I think that um, there's there's times when we don't even have a winter really. I mean, it'll get cold as shit. A couple of nights and it'll be you can go and play you, you go you know, like people are on the beach you know <laughs> it's uh crazy down here it's it's because i i'm an hour um, well about an hour inland or uh, i'm an hour from charleston which puts me probably i don't know to the coast actual coast probably 40 to 50 minutes maybe because or 35 to 40 minutes as a crow flies so but i'm just above where the title waves come from the hurricanes pretty much i mean we got rivers and we're in the swamp so the rain washes us out more than water from the ocean so we're quite we're a little elevated <laughs> just the, above that ocean you know, you our sea level you know oh there we go what is that a cannabis so, pepper plant the pepper i grafted onto the the cannabis plant here this plant was pretty late into flower you can see the buds little popcorn buds in the back back but um, this is an actual pepper we grafted on. I grafted onto a my my coworker Joanne at the time at Aquaponic Source was like, "What are you gonna do? Take the take the pepper cutting and and graft it onto your cannabis plant like sarcastically?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm gonna go do that. I'm gonna see what That's happens." Awesome. <laughs> so, but yeah, it actually it, it worked. I mean, I I chopped the plant down about another three or four weeks after this, but I got one pepper off of it just for the sake of saying I did it, which was pretty cool. <laughs> That is cool. Did you, uh, what would you, is that a, is that a Dutch bonnet? Because they make different colors. No, that? no, that was a, that was just a regular, I think that was a, a Poblano, not Poblano, um, Serrano. If I'm oh, right. Serrano, okay. I couldn't tell. It looked like it was more purple blue than green. That's, I couldn't tell. It might have been. I was growing purple and blue Serranos, and I had some pretty large Serranos, so. Yeah. Awesome. I'm super hardcore into peppers. Well, that's something else. Uh, that's something else, too. 
They're um, a great allegory plant. If you're if you're in a state that's less than legal and you want to get used to growing stuff and grafting and the pruning techniques and the pinching and bending and super cropping and, and all the same defoliating, all the stuff that you would do to a cannabis plant, they're a great plant to learn on um, and in anticipation of legalization if you're trying to get good at something. They're a great allegory plant. So, Well, they taste great uh, too. Yeah. The only problem I'd say to that is that they're a lot snappier. They're very brittle. You got to be real careful. Of those well, snap and break and yes and no. If you if you pinch them right and the nutrients are right, they'll, they'll, they're good. Um, let's let's do a quick wrap up and and go over. Well, as soon as I try to do a wrap up, everybody gets up. Um, I guess I'll go over what I've been doing. I'm still working on my yeah. my cannabis uh, company projects here in in, so, in California. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to talk more about that in another week or two. Uh, I know I keep saying that, but um, there's some uh, some issues we ran into regarding some of our, our paperwork that we had to adjust because of a, a new regulation that popped up and we had to adjust. Basically resubmit everything like the day after we finished submitting all of our paperwork. So I'll be able to talk about that more, uh, more freely here in the next couple of weeks. So, um, Mark, um, but aside from that, I think I'm trying to think if there's anything I, else I can say on that. All kinds of cool stuff in the works. We're working really cool hard on getting a lot, lot more really cool guests on the show. We had um, Carl on today. He's a really amazing guest. Next week we're going to have Endo, uh, Dustin from Endocana. He's going to be talking to us about cannabinoid deficiency diseases. Um, he has a very Ooh. rare form of cannabinoid deficiency disease, and will be talking to us about um, how it's helped him uh, basically get his life back. And he's a huge advocate. He's testified to state level Congress or state level uh, legislature as well as federal legislature um, on behalf of cannabis patients. And he's a really awesome dude. I, I had a chance to meet him when I lived in, in Colorado. Um, and they also make really high end extracts. So he'll be on next week, um, barring uh, uh, anything crazy happening. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've been up to. Marty wasn't able to join us. He had a, a family thing. Same thing with Fish Ganja Guy. So they'll be back. and. Um, uh, Brain Gross said he said hi. He'll be back with us here and uh, pretty soon as well. Um, he's been uh, been out for a few. Um, what have you been up to, uh, Tommy J? Well, research, research, research. You know, you, you know, I heard everybody talking earlier about they just want results, and I was thinking, yeah, you can't get results without the research. Yep. So I'm doing that. Uh, hooked up. Uh, we're having some. Uh, high-end uh, extraction equipment being sent to us. We're running some experiments with. Uh, Looking forward to that. that you know, went, up, <laughs> went up to the yeah, excited about that. Went up and saw the eclipse and those kinds of things. And, you know, we're getting settled back down here in Del Mar. Uh, getting ready for the next phase, you know, working on the projects that you're working on too. And uh, we're just excited and, you know, uh, kind of looking forward to being back around things that are growing. I really miss my back cave. <laughs> And uh, yeah, well, I'm looking forward to being around some some living things that I can play with and things like that. <laughs> well, yeah, we have a yeah. He's probably working on some of the same stuff that I'm working on. We have a, a bunch of bunch of fun things that we'll be able to talk about here before too long. We'll we'll get ourselves in trouble if we talk too much before uh, before <laughs> it all out. But I will have a, a website up soon and the rest, and then we can talk more freely. So, but yeah. I, I, I keep teasing stuff, but uh, I'm, I'm super excited and I'm not allowed to talk about why I'm excited and what I've been working on and why I've been in a different place all the time and everything. And I'm, I'm just super stoked to talk about it when I'm finally allowed. So we actually have some couple of cool guests uh, I'm going to get on the show um, for that episode as well that are involved in the project. And you guys are going to be pretty stoked when you see who, who else we're working with. So I know I'm pretty giddy every time I think about it. So. Um, so, uh, what about you, Roger? You got it. What other have you been up to? Yep. So gonna... um, just running the forum and uh, getting my uh, fall grow stuff together. Um, I'm trying to get uh, transportation to go buy my top rail to make one of my new hoop houses, you know, that we were talking about, so I can start my aquaponics project. And that's awesome. about it. Uh, <laughs> after, well, I'm not even thinking about it, but after night, um, I, I'm even more into the idea of, uh, see, I'm in an area where it'd be great. I, I think I'm going to get into bug ra raising bugs, you know, I don't know. I might raise bugs too, you know, and then I can feed my fish and, you know, and we'll talk about all that. We're not going to get into that too much tonight, but, uh, um, 
that's about all I've been doing. Run, just trying to keep the forum going, and and uh, if you want, in that well, I'll just I, I'll just move on on that one. I'm just fine. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm tired now. Awesome. Well, I think I think you both of you East Coasters are tired. I think we'll we'll wrap things up and let y'all go. I uh, really appreciate you guys coming on the show and everyone uh, coming on the show today. It was a little bit lighter on uh, on co-hosts than usual, so it was really awesome to see you guys step up. And uh, uh, yeah, normally we have four or five people for co-hosts, and today we just a little bit lighter crew. But it happens. Everybody has life happens, so and not everybody can be on every week. So um, it was really cool to see this show. Uh, uh, you know, get the get Carl on. I know. I think it was a. Uh, uh, We've been trying to get him on for a little bit, and uh, it's nice to finally be able to to line up schedules to where uh, we can get him on. And it's really, really awesome. Again, you're one of the favorite speak one of my favorite speakers I've ever had a chance to to go see talk on permaculture. So I really appreciate thank you. Coming appreciate on. it. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it a lot. I like the fact sometimes when we have a smaller panel because it was just we streamlined right through the show, had some fun times, and but we covered a ton of information and clarified all kinds of stuff for people out there listening. So they're going to all, I mean, gosh, the information you in the show tonight could be in a book. Yeah. Oh, shout out to uh, David uh, Hogmaster. Uh, he's was in chat today. He wasn't able to join us on the, on the, on the show, but uh, uh, it was nice to see him on. So I appreciate it, buddy. He's our and, buddy. Uh, yep. Yeah. And um, uh, do you want to tell people how to find you one more time, Carl? Maybe people will join late. Sure. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Just add me if you're a friend. Don't add me if you're a foe. Uh, you could message me on Tar River Trading Post. And uh, most of my contact details are found there. Awesome. What about you guys? Uh, how do they find you, Tommy? Oh, uh, I, I don't have much contact going up, but... Uh, my channel's uh, Old Art Gross, and uh, it's going to be changing up here. I'm going to be doing a little bit less growing and maybe some more exciting stuff of making sheets of amber that people like to look at. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and what about you, Roger? How can people find you? Well, I'm, I'm at ilovegrowingmarijuana.com. And uh, I'm the administrator there. I run the forum, and uh, we've got all our, most of our panelists and a lot of great experts there to help you out. Uh, we got all the copies of the podcast posted now, and uh, we're going to build some more podcasts up there. So we're I'm in the process of uh, uh, refurbishing the forum a little bit. We're going to we're going to build the podcast section and add more people that are like minded and part of say this. Uh, friends of your of the panelists here, which I've yet to really, you know, go to other people's pages because, uh, you know, we're all pretty busy, but yeah, we're working on it. And, um, you know, always check out I love growing supplies.com for flower power nutrients. And you can click on through and buy genetics out of Amsterdam from our website. Um, I love growing marijuana.com. Some of the best genetics. And, and Steve, I got, did you get my message? I got some real good news for you, buddy. I'll have to look. As Robert as decided, Robert, I talked to Robert now about gifting you guys some of genetics, man. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so well, he, he that'll help out with this new project we're doing. Uh, again, mm -hmm. may, I think the only thing I can say right now is we may or may not be working on a 22,000 square foot grow. I think that's the only thing I could probably say without getting in trouble. <laughs> so. well, and you can well, also wait. say it's going to be text. Yeah. Yeah, we want to we yeah. get it going so we can talk about it and then all of us can have a job. <laughs> well, Roger, there is the check-in guy. It checks all the IDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll make sure if you're not allowed, you're not allowed. You're not coming in. So, alrighty. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, if you guys want to check me out, um, you can check me out at Potent Ponics. If you're listening to the audio format version, uh, uh, you can listen to it at Sound on SoundCloud, um, and you can check me out on on YouTube at Potent Ponics. I have a bunch of other additional content on there, and um, appreciate everybody for watching. Remember, complaints go to APMeds at gmail .com. <laughs> <laughs> because he's not here this week. Um, uh, also, check oh, out wow. Marty's channel, uh, AP Meds, uh, and his Patreon, AP, AP Meds. He had some cool stuff on on this week on on uh, supplementation for uh, dual root zone stuff. So we should check that out. Um, yeah, Marty's got some cool shit going on, yeah. and it's cheap. I think the entry level thing for his channel is like three bucks a month. So I mean, everybody has enough money for like a can of soda. You know what I mean? It's not, he's not asking much. So. You know, support him if you got the extra three bucks a month. So, 
Awesome. All right, and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks again for Carl uh, and him extending uh, his time uh, to join us. So thanks a lot. Have a good one. Good night, everyone.